for my tens of dozens of viewers, possibly. Yeah. Uh, welcome back. This is my this is my friend Mike. Um, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself and and uh, uh, lay your own praises because it's been a while and I, I think I need to catch up on what you've been up to too. Oh sure. Well, thank you. I, that's, that's, that's kind. Um, since um, we haven't seen each other in quite some time, so since you and I have seen each other, um, I have taught at uh, Lane Tech High School. I spent three years as a middle school and junior high band director in District 130 in Blue Island. And I'm currently in my fifth year in District 206, Bloom Township District 206, which serves Chicago Heights, South Chicago Heights, Stager, Fort Heights, Sock Village, and uh, Glenwood. So um, I played professionally, uh, rhythm and blues, uh, saxophone, I've held a private studio, the high school program that I run now, we've gone from um, like 80 kids when I took over and my projected numbers for next year are 209. Nice. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, uh, we have a competitive core style marching band and last year, well, 2019. Uh, we, offered for the, <laughs> we offered for the first time um, a volunteer base uh, HBCU style show band. So we're, we're running two different marching bands. Uh, I have three different levels of traditional ensemble, a beginning band, a symphonic band, and a wind ensemble. Um, we've been in the Southside Irish Parade, the Thanksgiving Day Parade downtown. We were slated to go to Disney World last year and then everything shut down. Nice. And it would have been the first time that the school traveled in 17 years. So there's a lot of really positive things happening um, where I'm at right now. That's good. Uh, I was fortunate uh, last fall to be honored as the WGM Teacher of the Month. Uh, yeah, I saw that. Yeah. That was some familiar face on the TV. Yeah. Or whatever people watch it on now. I'm dating myself with the, the you know, the, the big box with the tubes inside. But... <laughs> I saw it for the first time on the television. So, <laughs> you know, I mean, it, was, it was shared all over social media. And that's where a lot of people caught it after the fact. But yeah, um, yeah, somebody sent me a text message and was like, hey, um, the, the preview was on and it was like 7.30 on a Sunday morning. I'm like, okay, so I'm having my coffee. I'm like, oh, look, I'm on television. <laughs> that's, that's pretty neat. So, yeah, yeah. yeah that, it's, I mean, you know, given the circumstances of last year, it's, it's nice to hear uh, uh, how well, how well uh, things have gone. Um, now uh, let me. Uh, I'm, I'm going to jump around the map here. Uh, uh, how did how did you get started in in music in the first place? Because you, you've you've come you've come a, a long way to this point. Um, how, yeah. How did everything start for you? I think everything for me. Um, the, the very start of it was like a lot of us started. Uh, we took band in grammar school. Uh, for me, it was offered in fourth grade. Uh, so we started and it was, you know, pull out lessons from our regular classes, which was really enticing. Yeah, I get to leave my regular class and I'm going to go to band. Um, and I wasn't really serious about it through eighth grade. But then um, it was time to pick where I wanted to go to high school. And I, I went to a, pr a private Catholic school for grade school. And the assumption was that I would do the same for high school. I grew up over by Midway Airport, and there were a lot of great um, programs that were offered. Um, a lot of my friends went to St. Lawrence and St. Rita, Brother Rice, uh, mm -hmm. you know, St. Joseph's. Um, and, uh, and I went and visited all the schools, and then uh, I went and visited Marist, and I was like, oh, this is where I want to go. I just thought the band sounded fantastic. They were playing really cool music, and, and that's where it started. And then... I got a little more serious about it in high school because of my peers of some of the upperclassmen who were just playing way better than I was. And I was like, well, I want to play like that. Right. Well, how, how, how are you doing that? Well, I take lessons. Okay. I want to take some lessons. And I took private lessons at a, at a uh, studio in, um, uh, in Hickory Hills or Payless. I forget which one it was either way. Um, 
but you know, to the point where like during the summer I would ride my bike with my saxophone duct taped to my handlebars because <laughs> I had no way to get there because uh, my parents were both working. Uh, and I would ride my bike like 10 miles to go to my lesson. You know, I look back kind of now. Yeah. I, and, and I don't know, I, you know, at the time I was, it was more of a, I need to go do this because my, my mom's paying for it. Um, but I look back at it now and I'm like, yeah, but that really was some dedication. So there was, there was a seed there that I didn't really know was growing. Yeah. Um, and then I spent my first year in college as a structural engineering major. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. Up in Milwaukee school of engineering. And it was a great experience, but they had a little pep band. And I'm, I not, was, I'm not sure I knew that about you. Uh, the, that's, that's weird. The uh, most, cause most of the, uh, for, for anyone watching, uh, Mike and I met at, at uh, Western Illinois. Um, yeah. And uh, so my whole context of, of you is from mostly from music. Right. Uh, and I, I think occasionally swinging a stick at each other. That's, yeah. That's yeah. another story. But... Martial arts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, if, if we were disciplined about it, we could have called it martial arts. But yeah, there you go. I think your, your framing of stick swinging is much more... <laughs> much more accurate <laughs> um but you know i was i was playing in in the in the pep band for milwaukee school of engineering and i was just really frustrated because um i was happier doing that than i was anything in my other classes you know mm. i was i was good enough at the engineering thing so i left and i came back and i enrolled and um i got a degree in classical saxophone performance and in the, my final semester, my professor said, hey, I, I have an opportunity for you. Um, you got to go and try out with this band. And it's a band that she had been playing in. And so I had only, and I had played in some pit orchestras, but never a pro gig, like a mm -hmm. blues or a jazz gig. So the audition was at Green Dolphin Street, which is still there, but not in the capacity that it was before. But, mm -hmm. And so I talked to the band leader and he goes, well, um, you'll play the first set. If it works out, you know, you'll stay for the rest of the show. If not, I'll uh, give you 50 bucks and send you home. All right. And funny story with that. So the two other guys playing horns on that gig. The first one I ran into, his name is Ed Enright. And Ed is an outstanding saxophonist in the Chicagoland area. I didn't know this at the time, but what I did know about him as we're talking. It's like, oh, so what do you do? You know, I'm a student, blah, blah, blah. What do you do, Ed? I'm an editor for Downbeat. <laughs> and that was gut punch number one. Right. And then the second one, uh, I'm talking to the other guy, and a lot of people know him now, but it was, it was Chris Madsen, who had, within the last couple of weeks, had just come back from New York, finishing his master's in jazz studies at Juilliard. Wow. And I was like, yeah, I'm on the wrong gig. Um, <laughs> but you know what? Everybody on the band's name was really cool. And, you know, while we're playing, the other two guys were like, no, 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 no. You know, to kind of take it this way. And there was some encouragement and pointers and stuff. Um, and, and, and a lot of what made it click, though, were the personalities. You know, musically, uh, you know, technique-wise, I was fine. But style-wise, I wasn't there. Mm -hmm. um, but the personalities work and you know that's one of the biggest things that I've taken away from playing with professional bands is you, you could be such a great player but if you're a jerk nobody wants to work with you, you know? yeah and, and there's certain points where you can kind of behave in certain ways and get away with it because maybe you are that good but for most of us you know we want to work with people who we enjoy being around you know and that's how I got um, really deep into, into playing. And then I went out to Western where I met you and um, really glad I met you out there. We had, we had a great time. Um, and we played some together on that old, uh, the, that old, uh, the, the, was it a Panama saxophone? Oh, wow. Oh, yeah. That, yeah. Yeah. I still have that thing lying around. Yeah. Um, I, I can't imagine how it smells now if I open up that case. Uh, <laughs> But last time I picked it up within the last, I, I don't know, five, five to eight years, it's still played. <laughs> we'll, we'll see what, we'll see what kind of animals fly out of it when I open the case again. 
it still pops up in my in my uh, my Facebook feed every now and then. Memories from right. God at this point, what <laughs> thirteen years ago? I think it, I think it thirteen fourteen years ago. Yeah, time um, time flies. Yeah, um, but you know, and then I came, um, finished up at Western and I came back, and I was I had a private studio that I was running. I was an assistant marching band director at Eisenhower High School in Blue Island, and I was just getting a lot of joy out of it. And my wife recognizes this and she's like you need to do this you need to be a full-time teacher and she was already teaching at this point for three years two years or three years um she was a, a high school spanish teacher and so i took her advice and i got the degree and you know, the rest of the teaching history i've already talked about so it was the right choice for yeah. sure that's, yeah. that's fortunate you have somebody uh who was uh who had the foresight to to help you find that that joy I know there's a lot I, I've met. I mean, you, you and I both have interacted with a lot of different talented musicians. And I think dis, I feel like despite that talent, I've met a lot of people who are still kind of lost about what to do with it. I, yeah. I, don't, I don't, you know, I'm, maybe your experience is different, but I, I feel like I've, I've, I feel like I've talked to a lot of people. It's like, yeah, I can play my horn real, you know, really well, or, or at like, you know, the, the doctoral level, whatever that means. Mm -hmm. and just what do you do you know the 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 um planning or the dreams fall short and then you just you know feel a little lost but yeah i mean so congratulations to to you to have some some guidance um but i don't i don't know i feel like uh you know you 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 may have found that eventually but perhaps a, a little later if you didn't have some help um, it's, it seems like you've gotten a lot of joy out of it. Um, I, I might've found it later, but I, I, I don't think it's a guarantee that I would have. Um, and if I did, it might've been too late. Mm. Um, you know, I made the transition at a very interesting moment in my life because when I applied for my first job, I was my first full-time teaching job. I was 29. Is that right? 29. Yeah. And so in a way, I was a really I was a very attractive candidate to the administrators because, you know, the, there was a, a larger distance of time between myself and the students that I would be teaching. And at the high school level, it's very it's really critical. Um, and I had a lot more life experience under my belt, which allowed me to be more confident in how I approached teaching in the way that I did. Hmm. Um, and so I, I think it helped me. Um, I, I tell my students all the time is that my, my children come to my school quite often and they'll come and visit. And then my students will be like, Oh, Mr. Belek, you, you're, you're such a good dad. I'm like, you know, it's a nice compliment. And I say, I'm, I'm, I'm good at it because it was the right time. If I had had kids when I was 22, I mean, I, probably would be okay, but I wouldn't be the dad that I am right now because um, I wasn't ready for it. And I think in a lot of ways, I wasn't ready to be a teacher mm. with this many students at 22. In a private studio, in a one-on-one -on -one setting, it felt very different and, and it was good. And I, I developed a lot of skills there. Um, but when you're in front of 40, 50, 160 kids, you've got to have a certain command about you and it wasn't there when I was in my early twenties, you know, yeah. it wasn't there. So yeah, I am very lucky. Yes. That's great. Um, man, there's, there's a lot, of, there's a lot of different directions. I, I, uh, I feel like we can go the, um, let's see what, um, here, let's, let's start with this. What's a really good day at work for you? I mean, I, well, let me let me let me backtrack a little bit more. What what is a day at work like right now? Because things are still kind of unusual. Yeah. What, what's a what's a normal day even like right now? So that's that's a really interesting question today, because today for the first time, we had students in the building since the start of the school year. Oh wow! So we've been completely remote, um, and then today we welcomed freshmen back. Um, so we have about 12% of the student body in the building at a time, okay. um, which is really easy to manage. 
So it's just freshmen this week. And it was exciting to see those kids. Uh, to, to be fair, some of them I had never seen because they never turned their cameras on. Yeah. So they came to the room like, who are you? <laughs> you know? um, and, uh, but it was, it was very stressful because I'm trying to manage them and not manage. It was, you know, the most I had was three in front of me today. I don't want to say this. I was trying to give them as authentic of an in-person learning experience as they could have. But then I'm also trying to be cognizant of the kids on my screen. Oh yeah. Because we're we're doing it, we're you know, we're doing hybrid learning. And so I'm working really hard to not do anything in the classroom that the kids can't do at home because not all the kids are coming into the building. And if I have special stuff for the kids in the building, it's an inequitable education. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's tricky. And I think today was filled with a lot of, um, I'm going to say reserved excitement. We're really happy to see students again, get them in the building and interact with them. But then there's just a lot, of, a lot to manage on top of it. You know, reminder about the masks and sanitize your seat and, you know, passing out bell covers and making sure everyone's got their IDs and we're walking into the classroom this way and we're going back out that way. Yeah, all the and extra I, procedures. To... All the extra stuff. And I don't have a problem with any of that stuff, but it's just, it's, it, it's important. There are important things that we need to do to make sure that everyone stays as safe as possible. And it's a big responsibility. Um, but outside of today, there has been a lot more focus on individual development this year instead of ensemble development, which of course makes sense. Um, but we've done a lot of technique development, a lot of scale stuff, a lot of articulation exercises, um, rudiment patterns for the percussion, long tones with drones and tuning. Um, we've worked a little bit on trying to put together virtual performances and I've done a pretty fair job with uh, using GarageBand, mm -hmm. um, but there's some software that I just don't have that other people do. But the kids are grateful for what we've put together. And so it's, it's been, um, I think that the, the biggest challenge this year has been working to maintain the sense of community that we've developed in the band program that I run and that my kids help me run. Um, because as I said earlier, you know, the growth in the numbers, there's, you can attribute it to, you know, a higher quality music performance or greater success at marching band competitions or greater exposure because of parades. But those things come after the foundations and what we've built there is a really strong sense of community and family and belonging. And that's been the hardest thing to try to maintain over remote learning. Yeah. So um, to circle all the way back to your question, what does the day look like? Um, there's a lot of demonstration on my end on both my primary and non-primary instruments. And when it's on my non-primary instruments, sometimes I do a good job. Sometimes I suck really bad. Um, but when I don't demonstrate so well on the primary instruments, it's a learning opportunity. It's like, um, no, that double was not correct. And here's how we should go about fixing it and slowing it down is okay. Or, you know, when I went over the break, I didn't land my fingers correctly because I didn't have uh, my thumb in the position to just, you know, rock from the thumb key to the register key. I was sliding it up. And, you know, so talking about all these things, um, it, it's been a good learning experience for both me and the students. So there's a lot of demonstrating. Um, there's a little bit of lecturing and just trying to expose the kids to a wider variety of music. We listen to a song every day. Um, and then there's a lot of pleading. Please turn in your assignments right. so that I can give you points. You know, um, yeah, that's, that's what it looks like right now. Yeah. Nice. Well, I mean, um, curious to see how uh, everything plays out as this all goes on but uh you know hoping to see 
hoping to see things uh, eventually get to uh, a normal that we're all a little more used to. Uh, I don't know if you've seen any of my other videos. I, if, mm-hmm. if I have to edit, I like to horse around here and there and just leave little presents for my for my. <laughs> I would expect nothing less, Frank. <laughs> nothing less. Uh, yeah, I, I think it's. I think I like to run this how I run my uh, how I used to write my grad papers. Like try to push the line and try not to get kicked out of the program. <laughs> uh, Some of the things that you wrote in there, yeah, you made Brian's head explode. <laughs> oh man yeah good good times we, we did yeah. have a lot of good memories in that program um, absolutely yeah and yeah i mean look where we are now i mean i yeah i don't know how much what percent of your uh success you'd credit directly to western but certainly forged us as people enough to to end up you know whatever whatever we've accomplished to this point you know that's part that's part of it I, I think you're, I think that's, that's a really good um, representation of it. Um, <clears throat> I use some of the musicology knowledge in my daily practice. Um, definitely the writing development um, has helped me a lot and it's helped me with my students as well because I feel confident speaking to them about certain structures and phrases and stuff and citing things. Um, but yeah, I, you know, even though there were some, there are some shenanigans and whatnot, um, forging us as people, I think is a really, a really great way to represent that. I remember um, the summer that I spent there um, living in the, uh, this, the, the one bedroom apartment in Lemoyne village in the middle of nowhere. I decided to, uh, for whatever reason, I was like, oh, well, let's read The Grapes of Wrath. I had never read it before. And I thought that would be a great book to read by myself alone. And I remember getting to the end of the book. This is a very specific feeling. And I think that is one of the worst emotional states that I've ever been in. Mm. And a lot of it, of course, was because of the book and Steinbeck's just extraordinarily poignant writing, but also just the emotional state of living in Macomb. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. For, yeah. for anyone listening who doesn't understand, uh, um, it's uh, Macomb is kind of a little mm. island in, in a sea of corn and, and, and loneliness. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and I think everyone, I, I, I don't know about you, but everyone I met there, like most of us, um, at least people I still keep in contact with, we we were there with some kind of specific, you know, like I was there for Eric Ginsburg. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, the rest of the program was, you know, as far as I could bend it, was going to bend to my will and my needs. Um, and I, I could care, I, I, I couldn't have cared less about, for instance, being a member of, of any of the the wind ensembles um you know like or or uh you know any of the other stuff that people people might think was a definitive part of your college experience i just didn't care i wanted what i wanted yeah i feel like a lot of people i feel like i met a lot of people with similar similar goals in mind like i want this out of this program you know or like i'm i'm very specifically headed this direction once i'm out of here Mm-hmm. You know, and then the other side was I met a lot of people who just didn't know what to do after high school, and then they were in Macomb for years and years, uh, burning yeah. up uh, loan money. <laughs> <laughs> there was some of that too, yeah. Um, I think there was definitely a lot of that um, in the graduate program, you know. But I don't know. I don't know how much different that would be from any other place, you know, That's at true. the graduate level. I will tell you. And I, I didn't pick up at it at the time, but what I was really impressed with was the, the diversity of the music ed students, the undergrad music ed students. Um, there were some really strong individuals mm. uh, who are running some really solid programs um, right now. Uh, one of the ones that, that comes to mind is uh, uh, Dan Tripp. You know, um, and he's done great things. He's been at a couple of different places. 
Um, he's run some really great programs. And like I said, I didn't really pick up on it at the time because that wasn't my focus. Um, but now as an educator, I look back on it and go, yeah, there were a lot of really good things going on in there with the music ed students. Um, but anyway, um, and you know, not that there's anything wrong with Macomb, but it does allow you to really dial into who you are as a person <laughs> because there's a lot of alone time. Right. The, the, yeah. it's, the, it's the unintentional Zen retreat for, for two to five years. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah. I, and you know what i get it because i feel like i had it now that you now that you put it that way i feel like that was that was part of my experience as well i had my little um my little uh one one bedroom uh, shack house on the other side of town and when i wasn't busy practicing or writing papers there was a lot of uh s like self-analysis uh, time yeah um yeah, you know, and a lot of uh, what was the generation? A lot of PlayStation Two time too. I yeah. have to admit. Yeah. But um, yeah, I mean, this it's interesting. The the um, I I think for any any uh, current or aspiring professional listening in on this right now, the uh, the value of quality alone time uh, should you shouldn't be uh, uh, undervalued. Like you you so much can happen so much can develop when you have good alone time um i i think uh macomb was kind of scary alone time because if you don't have the guidance to or, or um i don't know forethought to to kind of do something with what with the the answers you come up with you, you might end up in a darker place <laughs> or just stay in macomb for a while longer yeah it, it definitely um demands a certain maturity out of any born to be able to handle that. Um, and I think I, I've been using this example the second semester with my students about their growth as musicians. And I think this can be said about, um, well, we're talking about, you know, that personal development and alone time, no matter where it is. Um, but that growth doesn't always happen in an upward trajectory. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of my students got really into all the social media hype about the stock market a month and a half ago. You know, the GameStop squeeze yeah. and everything. And, and you know what? And I jumped into it with them too because I was like, you know what? This is a platform that we can dialogue about and relate it to other things. And they were excited to talk about it. So, you know, I'll, I'll use like the, the Disney stock chart as an example. Um, you know, and, and what I told my students is like, okay, well, let's look at it back in 1982. And if my grandparents wanted to get me, you know, a stop, one, one share of Disney when I was born, it would have cost them, I think it was like a dollar 80 or something like that. And now I think today it was like 197 or something. You know, they're, they're, they're up this week, but I show them the chart over the last, you know, almost 40 years. And there's the ups and the downs and the ups and the downs. And they see that overall growth line like, oh yeah. We're going to make some money. I'm like, yeah, but you don't always feel like you are. And I think that um, when you are going through those alone moments and those personal development moments, in those, those down moments, those low ones, where, you know, as you talk about it with the market, you know, the dip, right? It's the wrong move to sell at the dip. So on the personal growth thing, it's the wrong move to quit or to lose your, your path. Mm -hmm. You have to almost reinvest in those moments. You take a step back, maybe you break it back down to the fundamentals or you know, just sort of reconnect with why you're in the place that you are doing what you're doing and then push forward with it. And then the growth comes. But those are challenging moments. You know? Don't sell at the dip. Don't quit when it's hard. <laughs> like, right. you know, but th th that's uh, yeah, that's the analogy. But it it works. It makes sense. And had you or I given up in Macomb, uh, neither of us would be the people who we are today. So we didn't sell at the dip. Yeah, <laughs> what, what's what's the phrase? Di diamond hands. The, diamond hands. Yeah. yeah. To the moon, etc. Yeah, this is really this is really going to date the video, um, you know, but awesome. <laughs> no, I, I, I like that analogy. I, I um, you know, I, I think uh, it's it's a good way to grasp 
um, personal development. And I, I like that you mentioned uh, returning to uh, fundamentals and foundational stuff. I know in my in my studio, that's always where we go back to. Um, in fact, I feel like I f- sometimes I feel like I do it too much because the kid will come in with, you know, an etude or something more musical. And I find myself digging in super hard to like, like, like sit up, blow, you know, blow into this end, you know, um, and we got to, you know, occasionally I have to pull myself out and, and go to the, you know, the art side of it. Like, how, how does it feel when you play? What do you, what is it, you know, all that kind of stuff, but f- fundamentals and, and foundation, because that's where the, that's where we build from the, uh, the, you can't have the flowers without the roots. No, no. I, I don't remember which percussionist it was, or if it was a percussionist. Something's telling me it, it's a, uh, it's John Wooten. But I've gotten, I, I've watched a lot of percussion videos over the last six months, because as far as performing next to double lead that's my weakest area mm. you know, but i'm responsible for all of those as a band director right so I've, wa- I've done a lot of watching and a lot of trying to play along with other people and taking a lot of uh fundamental technique guidance from professionals who take the time to make videos and explain everything which is really helpful but one of them said i don't teach any advanced skills there are no advanced skills. There's just fundamental skills applied in a variety of situations. And in percussion, it's very easy to be convinced of that because even some of the most complicated patterns can essentially be broken down into the fundamental rudiments. You know, closed rolls and open rolls and paradiddles and drags and Radam McHugh's and all that stuff. And then I think about for us as wind players and, you know, what is extended range except for controlling long tones and embouchure and airspeed and direction. And that's it. It really is. You know, no, you're not going to, you know, play G's above the staff as a first year clarinet. Well, not intentionally. Yes, no. Um, right. <laughs> um, but but if it, you know, so I I don't I don't disagree with your approach. You know, we do that all the time. You know, my my kids like oh, but like we're playing long tones again. Yeah, we are because if you can't sustain this pitch, you know, within plus or minus five cents for a given period of time. How can I count on you to play that arpeggio in tune? You can't. Or how can you count on yourself? You can't. So, um, you know, plus also, you know, those fundamentals, because they're so simple, allows everyone the space to really understand what their playing feels like. So I think that's great. Well, good. Yeah. It seems to be working for my students. It seems to have worked well over the years because, um, they'll it, it, I, I tell them this now like if you if you just if you listen to me with an open mind and follow my directions you're you're going to get better mm-hmm. and a lot of them a lot of them have very quickly gone to the tops of their ensembles you know because just because they're they're cleaning up their technique enough to 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 handle the music better you know right it's not getting in their way anymore and, and, you know, saying that you, you had touched on a question earlier and then we, we went a different direction, which was fine. But what we're talking about right here answers a, how I would have answered the question. Um, you were getting at, you know, like, what does a good day look like? And a good day for me is when we can rehearse the music and I don't have to teach everything because all the technique work that we've done has stuck and they figured out how to apply it independently. Those are the happiest days when I'm in front of an ensemble. You know, I mean, yeah, mistakes, sure, but I'm not sitting there like, okay, let's break this rhythm down again, right. and everybody clap it together. And there's times for that. You know, that, that's, that's fine. 
But when we can go through something and they're tackling it on their own or they'll raise a hand and they'll ask to stop because they know that their section is trashing it, but they know how to fix it. Let's go back and do it again. Yeah, because we're applying all those fundamental skills. Nice. Yeah. Oh, man. Um, this has been great so far. Are, are you still good on time? Good, Is yeah. there... All right. Cool. Um, I want to ask you a little bit a little bit more about your teachers. I know like you've, you've been, you've been under teachers for your instrument, your, your main instrument. And, you know, um, you're, you're in this education world now. I don't know if it's directly like, you know, you're, you're not sitting in a classroom learning how to teach from people, but certainly you've worked with people who you've learned from to, mm -hmm. to accomplish, you know, what you have. Um, I don't know what, which, which one you want to start with your instrument or people you learned um, education, the education world around, um, or maybe it might be both. I don't know. I think there's a lot of crossover, um, but let's go down the instrument specific one first. I don't know how you want to like guide, guide that conversation. Yeah, who, uh, the, 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 let's start with, um, let's start with the bicycle ride one. What? <laughs> Um, yeah. Now, other, other than, you know, there's a very responsible sounding sense of, of, uh, you know, financial obligation, but, um, was there something in particular about that teacher that, that was uh, also motivating or was it more, did, it seemed like a lot of it was like, again, your, your enjoyment of, uh, of it in the first place, but yeah. Um, I think with, uh, with Bob, it, it was probably the first time in a music lesson where it wasn't so rigid. Um, lessons were pretty flexible. Even though, you know, when I came unprepared, I, you know, I caught hell for it. Right. Um, and rightfully so. Um, appropriately, it was, you know... We played a lot of jazz. Um, it, Bob was a, a jazz saxophonist. Um, but we worked out of the Rubank method books. And we worked out of the, um, oh, what was the jazz series we worked out of? Jazz Concepts. I can't remember the, uh, the, the composer. I'll think of it and send it to you. Yeah. Um, but it was music that, that challenged me appropriately and it, it pushed me. The, you know, the Rubik method books, there's moments where they're like, oh, this is no big deal. And then, you know, you get to the bottom of the page and like, wait, what am I supposed to play? <laughs> right. Why? How? Um, and, and, you know, um, but we developed a good relationship, but he was also real honest with me about, who I was as a player and who I was not as a player. Um, I went back to him when I came back from Milwaukee School of Engineering and I came back in February and I started lessons back up with him again in March. And I said, Hey, um, I want to go to DePaul in the fall for, for jazz. And he goes, that ain't going to happen. I was like, quit. He goes, you're, you're not there. You're not right. And it was devastating to hear, but I needed to hear it. Um, and it changed direction for me. And I needed a place to, to grow um, as a musician. As dedicated as I was, I was not anywhere near as dedicated as other students my age, nor as advanced of a player as I should have been. Mm. I was very ill-prepared for um, my undergraduate program at the beginning. Um, I had two studio professors in college. Uh, Charles Martin was the first one. And, and, and Ms., Mr. Martin, um, who's also a high school band director at the time, um, he was an interesting mix between classical and jazz. Um, he had some pretty darn good classical chops. Um, but he could, he could swing too. 
And it, he didn't sound like a classical musician trying to play jazz. He sounded yes. like a jazz musician. Um, and, uh, you know, and there were some hard fought lessons with him too. Um, a lot of reality checks where I, you know, I thought I was way better than I was. And he put me in my place. And then after him, uh, I, I got Laura, Laura Reagan, um, who you may know as a clarinetist. Um, but she doubles, uh, but she plays in a lot of pit mm. um, orchestras. Um, she's, she, uh, her undergrad is in clarinet performance, and then she has a master's in saxophone performance from Northwestern. So she can play. Right. Um, and I think what I was expecting from Laura was a lot of gut punches, like I had been used to. Um, and maybe aggression. You know, it was a lot of my experience with band and, and lessons. Not, you know, I, again, nothing inappropriate, but, you know, like, what are you doing? Blah, blah, blah. And you're not prepared. That sort of stuff. And mm -hmm. never with her. And I remember being frustrated because I, in this one, this one lesson, and I, I had gotten a lot better already at this point, and I was a good student. And I was making the progress that I should, should have been making at the time. And I was ill prepared for this lesson. And I knew I was. But I, you know, I went and worked through some stuff. And I stopped and I'm like, why aren't you yelling at me? Would you just like, you know, rip my head off? She's like, no, why? You know, you're not doing it. I don't need to be bad about it to tell you that. You'll fix it. Okay. And it took me a long time to understand why she never went there. But it taught me in that moment to give my students the space that they need. And that doesn't mean to not hold them accountable. Right. But everyone grows at a different pace. And everyone grows in different directions. Um, and that was one of the most important things that I learned from Laura was, you know, understand the space that your student needs, establish the boundaries and the expectations, and allow them to grow within that space. Um, and I can say that for a lot of the, the professors and the teachers who I think have had the, the most influence on me is they allowed me the space to develop in the way that I needed to, mm. whether it was with my technique or my pedagogy or just my maturity, um, calling me out on things when it was appropriate, but allowing me the opportunity to learn from myself why what I was, what I was doing wasn't working. And that's how I work with my students a lot. And it seemed to be successful. Well, there you go. Yeah. Yeah, that's, I feel like um, that's one of the elements that always intimidated me away from um, being a band director myself, because, you know, in my, in my private teaching world, you know, I, I feel like I have the room, you know, one-to-one, -one, like I can really read you and understand you as a student. What do I really need to provide? Like, once I have a classroom full of people, like I, I'm not sure how I could balance and give everyone what they need in those numbers. I mean, I'm it's certainly not to the same precision as I could in a private studio. You know, so I, I admire uh, people like you who can do it, do it well, you know, and find, cause, cause that's, I consider that a skill that I, I just, I have not, um, you know, I, I've had a time or two, you know, substituting or whatever, being in front of the group. And, you know, it, it never like falls apart or anything like it's not pandemonium, but I never, you know, I never feel like I, like I've got it. You know, I always, I always feel like I'm missing something or I have this latent fear that uh, what if, what if I could have done something more and they're walking away without something that they need, you know? Uh Frank, that fear doesn't go away. 
<laughs> Good. <laughs> You're not alone in that. I mean, you know, um, whenever I have a, a senior who auditions somewhere that, you know, I think that they should get into and then they don't, you know, uh, the, I have to take inventory of myself. Did I not do the right things for the student? Did my student not put in the time? Did I not guide them the right way? You know, um, you know, my, my, a lot of my students um, don't have the opportunity for private lessons. Mm. It's, um, you know, whether it's money or, you know, they're responsible for younger siblings and they just don't have the time for it. And so a lot of repertoire exposure falls on my shoulders. Um, you know, it, you know, it, it's like, well, with clarinet, you know, it's, it's easy to just sort of fall onto the Rose book, um, which works yeah. for a lot of them. Yeah. There's worse, there's worse choices <laughs> than Rose. Yeah. Um, but you know, I, yeah, you, you have that fear, like, did I not do enough for them? That never goes away. Um, it's much easier to not have that fear with, with private students. Um, and I agree with you because it's one-on-one -on -one and you know the work that they're putting in and you have that hour a week dedicated to them. You know, you, you know that they're getting from you what they should be getting from you. But in a full, in a full program like this, no, it's, um, that's one of the biggest challenges. Um, and then, you know, when you're differentiating for your students, and trying to meet each one of them on their own musical level with what your performance expectations are of them um, with technical development. You're, 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 always, you're always having to ask yourself, am I actually working with their abilities and developing them the right way? Or am I just being easier on this kid because I know that they don't put enough time. And that's a hard question to answer. Mm. Um, and the only way that you, at least in my opinion, gain confidence with what you decide is taking its time, learning the students as best you can, you know, and unlike a private studio, you know, I see these kids five days a week for at least an hour a day. And if they're in marching band, if they're in other curricular, extracurricular ensembles, you know, there's a chance that I'm seeing them for 10, 15, 20 hours a week. So there's a lot more face time with them where yeah. you, can, you can develop that, um, you know, that, uh, that, report. that more intimate knowledge, I guess. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, at least, at least I feel less alone in my insecurity. <laughs> Oh, no, no, no. Um, but if there's a band director out there that says, I never worry about it if I've never taught my students enough, um, either their ego has gotten way too big for their own good, or they're an awful teacher. And Yeah, it's not like I, that's not out there. And I will go Wall Street bets on that with, with that <laughs> one. <laughs> oh, man. But, yeah, no, it's, it's reassuring to me. And, you know, I feel like um, – you know the the audience out there in internet land like there's there's bound to be people feeling the same way this is part of why i wanted to do um uh this whole this whole uh show you just we're, we're a lot of us are facing a lot of the same um you know pro, uh, professional hurdles uh you know like what we're talking about now personal responsibilities and insecurities um you know I'll, all this stuff, I, I, you know, I figure in 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 my circle, I, I want to share everyone's value and experiences, and we'll see, maybe, maybe like a this is like a larger, um, like broad shot uh, educational endeavor. Just whoever's going to get some value out of it. We all have experiences that are valuable, and we we should all take the time to listen to our colleagues, no matter what discipline they're in, because there are very specific pedagogical approaches or insights from studio teachers that ensemble directors can learn a lot from and vice versa. 
um, you know, when we think about, you know, repertoire selection, we've all overpicked for a private student at one point or other. And I would venture to say that most of the time, almost all the time, it's not out of ignorance. It's out of an abundance of faith in our students. Because like, oh, they're, yeah. you know, they're, they're growing, they're growing, oh, yeah, they can handle this. Yeah, let's go, let's give them this, you know. Yes. And three weeks later, you know, they're just devastated because they can't make any progress on it. And then you got to have to go, what did I do? Did I, yeah, I, I, that was my fault, you know. And you got to, and you have to own that as a teacher, right? And, you know, with, with an ensemble, it's the same thing. Um, I think it manifests itself a little differently because directors, like there's certain repertoire that we want to conduct, you know, and at the high school level, you have opportunities for that where it is artistically satisfying mm -hmm. to conduct certain pieces. You know, it's more of a challenge to find that I think at the, at the middle school and the junior high level, but it is still very much available. Um, but obviously there's a brighter, a broader range of re repertoire at the high school level. And yeah, there's certain things that like, oh yeah, I played, I played that as a freshman in college, but my high school band is better than that. We can do this. Can you, you know, should you, <laughs> you know, and you know, do you, do you spend the semester just browbeating the kids with only that piece of music right. or, you know, do you take that step back and go, okay, maybe, maybe we're not going to do this. Maybe we're not going to do the planets, but maybe we'll do, first suite there you go yeah you know and is first suite artistically satisfying conduct absolutely it is just as satisfying as the planet it depends on the conductor right um is one going to be more appropriate for your ensemble yeah and are the kids going to be able to apply their fundamentals in a way that's artistically satisfying for them yeah and those are tough choices to make though because it's not just one kid. You're looking at at least 45 of them. Right. You now, and how am I managing all these levels? So a lot of the challenges that, you know, private studio instructors like yourself have are the same ones that we have. It just looks a little different. I don't know if that's where you wanted to go at that moment, but that's where it went. So. No, I, I'm taking it as it comes, just like everything yeah. else. Um, Let's see. Who um, who do you feel like? Uh, let's let's go to your performance side again. Yeah. Who do you feel like are some of your major influences or or some artists that you just really love? As a classical saxophonist, um, I have gravitated towards uh, Naboya Sagawa, uh, who is a Yamaha artist, a Yamaha artist, and I, I saw him perform at Northwestern uh, probably 15 years ago. And it's holy cow, mm -hmm. uh, just incredible. Um, John Sampin is uh, the, the, the saxophone professor at Bowling Green State. And I've always gravitated towards his performances. Um, Claude Delon at the uh, Conservatoire de Petit. Um, and then there's, there's a saxophonist who recorded one album. And then from what we know, she left performing and moved out to California to save the whales. All right. And her, her name is Laura Hunter. And she recorded an album. Um, forget the title of the album, but there's a, there, there's a piece on there called... Uh, Shugath Mana by uh, it's a Concordia, hang on, it's a Concordia professor, Stephen Galante. Okay. And it's for saxophone and DX7 synthesizer. Hmm. And it's weird. But I, I kept going back to that album in my undergrad and just listening to that, that piece over and over and over and over and over again. And her sound, um, there was a certain ethereal quality to her sound and it just really drew you in and it was inviting and mysterious at the same time. And, and I, and I loved it. Um, that's on the, the classical side of things. 
Um, on the, the jazz and the blues side of things, it's an interesting mix because for a long time, it was the standard fare of Cannonball Adderley, um, you know, Charlie Parker for patterns, not so much for sound, um, Dexter Gordon. But as I started to get more into the rhythm and blues and, and, let, and further away from the bebop side of things, um, mainly because the members in my band were like, you need to change how you're playing or you're not going to have a job in this band anymore. <laughs> well, okay. I mean, you know, they gave me fair warning. Um, I ended up listening to a lot of uh, Eddie Cleanhead Vincent, uh, Eddie Lockjaw Davis, Hank Mobley, um, and uh, I, I still listen to a lot of Dexter Gordon. Oh, and uh, Zoot Sims. But what I was taking from their playing was like a more relaxed sound concept um, that wasn't as edgy as the bebop and the, and the hard bop guys. Mm. Um, but it incorporated a lot more blues sensibility and had more of a soul jazz um, feel to it, which is a lot of that blues synthesis into the jazz line. Um, but what I found for, for myself was that everything was much more accessible. It made sense to me mm. more on a first listen. It was more melodic and I could follow it against the, uh, against the changes a lot better. But Frank, I'll tell you what really changed the way that I played wasn't any saxophone players. I spent an entire summer listening to three guitar players. And it was T-Bone Walker, um, Magic Sam, and um, I always say the wrong, Albert. Um, no, uh, and, and uh, Freddie King. Freddie King, Magic Sam, and, uh, uh, and T-Bone Walker. And I took from their guitar playing, and I put it into how I approached saxophone. And it changed completely how I was able to dialogue with the other musicians on the stage. Hmm. Because within two months, I became way less concerned about the number of notes I was playing and more concerned with what each of my notes was saying. And that's a lesson that we try to teach our younger students who are tr learning to improvise. You know, they're going to hear Charlie Parker if they go look up, you know, oh, I want to listen to jazz saxophone. Who do I listen to? Charlie Parker and John Coltrane come up. And of course, they're fantastic, you know, but is an 11 year old going to understand giant, <laughs> giant steps? No. You know? <laughs> and I had that problem too. One of the first, um, after um, Louis Armstrong and his All Stars album, the second jazz album that I bought was uh, John Coltrane um, plays it cool. I mean, I go back to it now, and there are moments that I, that I struggle. Right. You know, I mean, it's, um, you know, and so I was listening to these guitar players who, and they all sang too, but their, their playing was conversational. And, it, and, and there was a, a very specific dialogue happening between their solos and the rhythm section. No. Sure, it helps, you know, guitar players part of the rhythm section and they become very intuitive with each other's playing. But, you know, and certain solos, I'd start turning away from the band, uh, from, from the audience, and I would play to my drummer, partly because he was one of the ones that threatened to fire me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like, look, Mark, I can do it now. You know? right. um, but we started talking to each other and it became a much more organic experience. And it felt so much better that it wasn't just me with like a backing track. It was yeah. an ensemble, even when I was improvising. That's what it's supposed to be like. But I think that the trick with it was is that I found 
I found what worked for me. You know, I didn't, I was never trying to force myself to be a, uh, to play straight ahead bop. Like that's not necessarily the player, the player that I wanted to become, but that's the stuff I was practicing. Mm-hmm. And, and yeah, you you're uh, not being true to yourself or, or yeah. uh, f- figuring out who you, who you really are. Right. And, you know, when, when you venture to enter the world of jazz, you know, a, a lot of people, to, you know, default to that, you know, um, you know, bebop is king. Um, and in many ways, rightfully so, because of the language that it developed and, you know, mm-hmm. the standards that it, that it um, you know, put, put on all of us. But, you know, a lot of the players that I mentioned, you know, uh, Hank Mobley, could he play bebop? Yeah. But is that what we all really listen to him for? For him to sound like, you know, Dexter Gordon or John Coltrane? No. We listen to Hank Mobley for the feeling and for those melodic lines and the sound. Um, and, you know, you've got to get to a point where you trust yourself to make those decisions and that's really hard and that's a mature thing to get to um the teachers like you and me we can help our get our students there sooner rather than later you know i think that's one of the best things that we can teach them yeah. you know help them find maybe you know, who they are too right. yeah it's it's interesting hearing you describe all that because i feel like i've run into a lot of um similar similar circumstances in, in, um, let's say, uh, classical ensemble playing, you know, um, I've been through a lot of orchestral auditions where it seems to be expected you play a certain way, but it's not necessarily, you know, like, like if you're expected to play just like, you know, XYZ clarinet player in XYZ orchestra, what, like, who are you as, as an individual artist? And like, is that, you know, maybe is that not a value in the setting, you know, um, the, uh, um, the way you describe, um, you know, the interaction, uh, you, between musicians, it's, it's a lot like what I, um, it sounds like what I wanted when I play, when, when I play chamber music, like, it's it's very much uh, the way I see it is a conversation, a certain yeah. intimacy between the uh, the musicians that the audience happens to be, you know, party to. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I agree that I, I've also heard heard and seen a lot of musicians who are trying to cram themselves into a certain performance style, and either it doesn't fit them or they don't know what who they actually are, you know. Um, and and even down to the you know like for for historical clarinetists like the the people we find that we admire the most were not it, it wasn't just how well they could recreate something you know like midi playback right there is a certain character to their sound to their you know you, you know as um i don't know if, as as organized as you know, the, the lines of classical music are like a good artist can bring out so much more than just what's on the page. And that, that's yeah. what, you know, I feel like some of the best clarinet players I've heard, like they bring those things out and they're looking at the same piece of music, the same page basically. Right. But. Yeah. Well, and, and in a much trickier context, because like you just alluded to, the expectation so many times is that it comes out the same. Yeah. To, but, to me, that's, to me, that's supremely boring. Like mm-hmm. if, if I want to play back music, like we have, we have technology now, you can just hit play and, and, you know, in, you know, insert whatever score I want. If that's, if that's all I want out of my music, you know, we, I don't even need a human being anymore, no. you know, but it's, this is, this is human art, human expression. I want to hear some humanness mm-hmm. and what do humans do? We, we, we talk to each other. We, we communicate 
you know, one way or another. Um, this this reminds me too, uh, you know, about how you interact with the, the other musicians. My YouTube feed, uh, so a video came up of it was, uh, who was it? Uh, Miles Davis looking disapprovingly at one of his band members, and I couldn't remember. And it, it, like you just see him like it, this this look of disgust. It, it, like silent disgust in the, in the middle of whatever they were playing and you know they, yeah. they chopped it to maybe 30 seconds but yeah it's like man they were they were definitely communicating but yeah it, it, it's the human the human communication part uh, it's yeah so i'm it, getting it's... getting all excited in my uh <laughs> my my uh older older age and losing control of my emotions <laughs> no, that's, it's it's a healthy thing to let the emotions out there. Um, it's 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 so tricky, and and how do I want to put this? With West with with like Western art music, um, if that's even the right thing to call it anymore, I, you know. Um, Outside of the expectations within the industry of you should sound like this, you know, how many of our audience members, when we get them, are at such a disadvantage of not having heard so many of these works, where if it doesn't sound like the one time they heard it, you know, their appreciation for it can't really be fulfilled you know and, and I guess the only you know the only way to really provide them that human artistry is to give them more exposure to it um, you know but are we going to have a clarinet recital with you know five different clarinetists playing the same piece of music <laughs> you know I mean um, you know it's, you know it sounds like a great studio recital um, yeah. <laughs> uh, but, you know, but in a way of like, yeah, that is the answer in a way. I I, I feel know. like I'm starting to see some of that now, actually, the, the way, uh, you know, like YouTube, for instance, if I know the name of a piece, whatever it is, I just type it in and I could have thousands of people who've played it, mm -hmm. you know, um, I, sometimes I've, 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 I've done this with my students, like, you know, ro rose etude from you know uh, from the thirty two number you know X Y Z. <laughs> Type it in. Here's fifty people. Let me pick three random ones. You can hear a little bit of each. Here, this guy. This guy can play really really fast. This one uh, sounds more interesting to me, even though they're slower. This one, you know, they 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 played. They learned to play in in. England so they they sound their clarinet sounds completely different or you know yeah. like um but yeah I mean the examples are out there and I think um the more you know the more that we uh start putting content out uh on the internet the more options people will have but the um you know the question is then Dri driving the interest in the first place to explore those things you know this is something i've talked with to some of my other music friends you know try trying to come up with some some way to play together through all of this you know some some way to put out content um you know like what what do we how do we even build the audience in the first place like um do we play you know, like some some uh, musicians i've seen uh, do it very well like uh, um, let's say uh, I'm, I'm gonna say who is it Lindsay Sterling the violin violin girl uh, she she's playing like a bunch of popular stuff you know video game video game music sometimes and we're building a new audience that way I don't yeah. know how much of that traffics to other you know like oh I want to I want to listen to Stravinsky now because of her yeah but you know, at least getting eyes on, um, you know, violin music uh, in the first place. Yeah, oh, like, seen... um, like uh, two set. Yes, two yeah. set. I, I love, I love their stuff. Um, and 
and it's not just gimmicky like they're great musicians too right. like um i was talking one of my pr- previous episodes i was talking with ginsburg about them and uh they had a uh, uh at least one video where they're 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 playing like 10 million dollar violin compared to their still super expensive but not 10 million dollar violins yeah um it was a great exercise in acoustics uh but that kind of stuff drawing an audience like you know who knows who's watching uh violin content now from other uh, musicians because of those guys you know? right right um I think a yeah. lot of the, the audience building, and this is a tricky thing to say because there are some band directors who may vehemently disagree with me, but that's, that's all right. A lot of the, the audience building is on the shoulders of band and orchestra directors and, and, and choir directors at the high school level. It's easy and it's easy enough for us to put like canon repertoire in front of our students and explain to them why it's important and we dig into it. And because of their experience on their instrument, they appreciate you know, when they hear the recording, like, oh, okay, I want to play that too. But it's just as easy to not expose them to music beyond what we're playing and show them how to appreciate it just for listening like you don't have to only play or only listen to what you're playing you should be listening to more beyond that and um i haven't done a good job of that this year i've done a lot i my my, but my focus for this year was more in um showcasing the diversity of artists, more from the pop side of things, but the, who, who are more representative of the students that I teach. Mm. Um, and, and it's been a very healthy thing for all of us. Um, but getting our students to listen to the music that we've played in college, right, or that maybe we'll put, we will put on in the car driving, um, and to get them to that point where they want to consume it outside of our classroom. It's a big ask of us, but I think it's part of our job. Um, mm. And, I, and I, I do that with my kids. Um, when, when we're talking about tone and expression in my ensemble classes, I always use opera. Um, and I'll use, um, I'll use Elizabeth, Elizabeth Schwarzkopf a lot and her Strauss recordings. Hmm. Um, there's, there's one particular, I think it's a Zeugnung, uh is one of them. Uh, and, and I'll use, um, I'll use Eric, Eric um, you know, uh, and kids at first are like, what, what, why, why are we listening to this? <laughs> opera? So I just roll with it. But then, and then I build them. And then partway through the year, like I'll show them like a 12 minute master class with opera singers and I'll pause it after the first two minutes, you know, when the, you know, the young graduate student is up there on the stage with somebody from the Met, right? And they haven't heard the person sing from the Met. We know what they sound like. They don't. And and I'm like, what's wrong with their singing? Like, well, nothing. What are you talking about? Like, yeah, watch. And then, you know, they get worked for for 10 minutes and then their sound is like 10 times better. Yeah. Yeah. And they're open, you know, and, and the body movement is engaged and they're like, oh, but it, but it is a process to get there. Um, and I don't know that the way that I do it is the answer, but it's an answer. But it is, at least again, in my opinion, a part of our responsibility to get our students to want to engage with that music beyond our classroom. You know, even if, you know, they go and, you know, they download or they go and they're like, oh, I want to, Mr. B said something about, you know, David Maslanka. What does he sound like? Whoa. Yeah. He sounds cool. <laughs> like, you know, go listen. You know? Um, and they come back like, yeah, Blackie, we listen to that piece. You know, 
So we were watching. What was the uh, what was the series? It was an episode of Stranger Things from the last season, and there was a snippet from an opera, uh, the drinking song from uh, La Traviata. Mm. Right. And it was playing. They were having like the ball or something. And the kids knew that I was watching Stranger Things and everything. We came back the next day and we're like, Blackie, did you hear it? What are you talking about? The song we played in our marching band show, it was in Stranger Things. <laughs> and, and it was because I used it in one of our shows. Um, but like they heard it and they were consuming it in a different and like and they were really proud of themselves, you know, stuff like that. Um, but yeah, just how to get them into it. It's tough. Yeah. It's tough. Yeah. It's it's a struggle that like I, I've seen in the orchestra world because there, there's this I feel like there there's this sense like, oh you know, we're we're high art and we don't want to like sell out somehow, you know. But if your if your audience is like ninety percent people above eighty, like eventually you're gonna lose that audience. And like if you can't get over, you know, however you feel about yourself and the art that you're presenting and try to try to approach a new and younger audience with, you know, like it's just gonna go away. Like you're you yeah, and I've seen it happen, especially, you know, with when everything shut down, you know, like just groups closing for good, you know, because whatever, you know, like whatever performing they were doing, that was, that was already like the end stage of their group, you know, from why I assume. Yeah. You know, um, but yeah, I, I think, yeah, cer- certainly engaging at, uh, at, at the school, you know, school music level, but then figuring out figuring it out at the professional uh, the professional level to how how we can i don't know get over ourselves somehow and uh, you know i mean i i hate to i had to dump on you know me and my colleagues but that's that's what i see you know um yeah and, and i feel like there's so much great music out there that a good you know or, or uh, at least or some reasonably capable orchestra could pull off like look at all the look at all the video game scores over the last you know coming up on on 15 20 years now it's not just you know 16 bit beeps and boops anymore like um you know the i don't know what the royalties would be to perform this stuff but like imagine uh, the the all the marvel movie stuff Mm -hmm. you know like stuff that oh i re- i recognize this from something you know uh and who's to say we can't have you know the 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 meat and potatoes style uh um concert where you know you invite people in with something they know and then here's here's something similar that like from the classical art music world and then you know the, like like putting putting the medicine in the spoonful of sugar yeah like i i don't know uh, it, it's what I see. I don't have the one solution either, but uh, you know, it, it bears discussion and it bears some, some, at least some attempt to, uh, um, to resolve. Cause otherwise, you know, where do we go from here? Yeah. I don't know. And it's, uh, you know, depending on the high school programs too, there are those challenges where, you know, parents, don't want to sit through, um, you know, of sailors and whales from the best, you know, or they don't want to sit through. Uh, and there's a there's a Mislanka piece that I, I want to play. And it's you know 14 minutes straight, and I'm hesitant to because parents are going to. I have administrators. Blah, 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 blah. That's but, that's like one track from Tool, right? I, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Maybe if I just put visuals up behind yeah, it, right. be okay. um, you know, but at the same time as a band director, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm sitting here going, 
if you want pop music, come to the basketball game. Come to the football game. Come to the fall concert. Like there's an outlet for it. Um, and, and, I, and I struggle with that too because my mentality is for my students who do want to go on to university, they need to have some of this under their belt. I can't send them in blind. That would be irresponsible of me. Yeah. And, you know, even though not everybody wants to hear this music as an audience member, it's my responsibility to do this because where else are they going to perform it or not? You know, um, and, and so those are, there's larger conversations to have with audiences and, and people who are signing the checks too. Um, you know, but that's, sure. and, that's, and that's a conversation I think anywhere. You know, the people managing the books, well, you need to bring more people in. Well, we want to, we want to play, you know, only Wagner this year. Well, that's not going to bring people in. So, you know, play more Mozart, but Wagner, right? Like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I get it. So th- there's, uh, there's our homework assignment for, for our audience is yeah. solve these problems so that we can keep doing music things. Yeah. Um, you're, uh, you're pretty active at everything you're doing. Um, what's something you feel like takes up too much of your time? Oh, it certainly sounds like you have a lot to manage. Um, yeah, I, you, uh, I mean, this year has also been unusual. This last year has been unusual, but uh, at some point, are you expecting to maintain a, a professional playing schedule as well? No, I actually stepped away from playing pretty regularly because my high school program has grown so much. Uh, I see. Um, I am still a, a like a first call sub for the for the Rhythm Rockets. Um, and I've been called up by a couple other groups within the last, actually I got called by a group in October. They were doing a socially distanced shoot thing. And, uh, but it was one of those where I wanted to, um, but I had to teach all day. And then I also wanted to be a dad. And I was like, yeah, no, I'm going to do this instead because, yeah. you know, um, you know, and I want to be really clear that me stepping away from playing professionally is not a regret at all. Um, I was very content with where I was as a performer. I don't know, it's not content is that, because I, I feel like content always implies a sentiment of uh, like something else you you wanted something else kind of yeah like i settled right like it was good enough you know um i was happy yeah with what i was playing satisfaction yeah yeah thank you yeah i was satisfied very satisfied um the group that i was in had pushed me musically throughout the years there were good friendships built into it it was a healthy dynamic it was a well it's a well that well-run group um, a good leadership, um, and I was valued as a member of the ensemble. And I think that's the most that m- any of us can ask for mm-hmm. in whatever style or genre we're, you know, we're playing. Um, and so my choice to step away from it, it was my choice, uh, was because I just, I, you know, I needed to maintain a healthy balance of work and life. Um, and the way that my school program was growing which was my own fault. Like nobody, none of my bosses said, you need to change this. You know, I could, I could still be at 80 students and I'd probably still have a job and everybody would be like, okay, it's the band, whatever. Um, but you know, it's not anyone's like, Oh, Hey, it's the band. Right. Um, and so because those choices were my own, it was easy enough to step away from the plan because I was finding satisfaction in this as well. Um, so I still enjoy playing and I will, once everything goes back to normal, I am sure that I will 
be on stage a couple of times a year. Um, and you know what? And for me right now, that's, that's plenty. Because there's also a part of me that thinks about starting a gig at 10 o'clock at night and not getting home until 2.30 in the morning. And I have a six-year-old yeah. and a nine-year-old, and I go, no, <laughs> no, I won't be in good shape you know, the next day. Um, yeah. And I laugh about it, but it's serious. Yeah. Because uh, I, I want to be present for my kids. Um, but I, uh, I've played a lot this year, though. Oh. I've played a lot of, on instruments that are not my own. You know, well, yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, my 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 trombone skills have never been as good as they are right now. Yeah. And I'm kind of proud of that. Yeah. It's growth in other ways. Um, I also think, and I didn't know that this answer was to your question was going to go here, but I kind of like that it's very fluid. Um, I think we owe it to ourselves as musicians. If to play, if not on a different instrument, rep from other instruments. Mm. Yes, yes. And as a woodwind player, I actually think it is critically important that we take some time of our month and play a brass instrument. Because when I take time maybe it's 10 minutes a day during my lunch break or whatever. If I take 10 minutes and I play even just like etudes out of like a beginner level trombone book. Um, and I shouldn't say beginner level, um, not method book, but like beginner level etudes, right? Mm. Even playing out of there. My, um, my pitch accuracy improves so much Hmm. my sensitivity to tone gets exponentially better within the week and you know because as woodwind players for the most part push button make the note you know and there's so much more to that you know i know okay yeah but to do that same activity on a brass instrument it it takes more effort and and it demands more of your inner ear Mm. and i think it's 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 healthy for us i really do um and if i were to be even more specific about it i would say that we should all play a low brass instrument because of the depth of sound Right. And the warmth of it, because when we play an ensemble, you know, we talk about fitting inside of the lower end, mm. right. Building it from the bottom up, you know, and, and for that balance, we want more of that bottom end sound than the top sound. So it sounds fuller. And so we have to find ways, you know, within our own timbre to fit in to that lower end sound, whether it's the double basses and the cellos or it's, uh, you know, the tubas and the trombones, depending on the ensemble that we're in. But I also think that by playing on those instruments, we get a better sense of what that means and where that sound comes from and how to interact with those instruments more effectively in an ensemble. Yeah, no, that makes that makes sense. Yeah. Um, so go out and get a trombone. Right. <laughs> uh, that was... When I was doing, because uh, I did music at undergrad and I had to learn a lot of those instruments, mm-hmm. that trom- trombone oh, always felt a little easier to me for you know com- for my clarinet embouchure because mm-hmm. uh, there's there's just more real estate. You know, like I even now if I ever put my lips to a trumpet or or French horn uh, mouthpiece, I I just feel uh, <laughs> I don't feel like I. You know, like what, what's um, that the excess of tissue <laughs> to to fight with? Um, but yeah, no, I uh, it makes sense. It makes a lot of sense. 
you know, if you're working with somebody, why not, why not understand them more? You know? And, yeah. Um, and, 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 but, I, but I'll reinforce that I, I think even outside of playing within an ensemble, cause I've gone, um, you know, on certain days, you know, I'll, I'll practice on a non-primary instrument, you know, uh, at, during a prep or during a lunch break or whatever, just to clear my head. Um, and then maybe in, later in the day after I've done all my classes and maybe I had a marching band and before I go home, like I just, I really need to play some meaty stuff. And so I'll get my prime, my primary out. You know, I'll get my alto and I'll get some classical etude up. But even, you know, even just with my solo rep, I feel much more centered after playing on brass because the, the brass instrument demands that you are, hmm. um, you know, and playing at a high level on our instruments demands that we are too, but it feels more intuitive. You know, even though I'm not playing in that ensemble, like I feel more grounded in those lines and I, and I hear um, harmonically better where everything is situated, even without the accompaniment. It's, it's all just very present. So, yeah. But that's just my experience. Yeah. Yeah. I, wave it, I wave a stick and yell for a living. <laughs> right. Oh, are, are you, um, I can't remember this far back. Are, are you one of the kind of uh, conductors that has like a, a finely hand turned uh, baton or, or are you like the, um, you know, the, the, the bargain basement uh, giant cork bulb fiberglass baton guy? Um, I have both, uh, and I will use the economical choice, um, on certain occasions if I know I have to do a lot of tapping. Yeah. Oh, um, yeah. but what I have found, uh, and I think physically, you know, you can, you can relate to this cause we're we're both wider individuals and, and sort of uh, we're stocky and movements that we do tend to be more muscular in nature than they need to be. Yeah. The, the overdrive. <laughs> yeah. The little, uh, yeah. No, yeah. I get it. And so um, I was in a conducting workshop um, 14 years ago, maybe. And the clinician was Dr. Gerald Welker from uh, Alabama. And he ran, he conducted some incredible ensembles down there. Mm. And I also learned about him that he was one of the saxophonists playing on the Mercury recordings of the Eastman Wind Ensemble under Fennell. Ooh. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so uh, there's some depth to Dr. Welker. I think he's unfortunately no longer with us. Hmm. Um, but I'm up on the podium and we're doing the bells, was the movement, the bells from. Uh, well, that it is an English folk song suite. No, William Bird from the William Bird suite. All right, it's in three four. And um, I'm conducting along and I'm going through it and I prepared as best I could. I think I'm doing a great job. And he comes up, Michael, you're a kind of a stocky guy. Yeah. You're just very muscular in everything that you're doing. Yeah. Have you ever been to the restaurant, Big Boy? Yeah. Like, where does he go with this? Can, can you pose like him for me? And he made me on the podium, like, do the hand on the hip with the plate up in the, like, the the burger boy from Big Boy. He's like, that's what you remind me of. You can't conduct like that. <laughs> like, 
<laughs> okay. <laughs> um, and, and a lot more happened in that session. And, and I, I developed a, a lot as a, um, as, a, as, as a conductor in that moment. Um, but with that muscularity, it, 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 I found the more that I've conducted, I start to transfer a lot of tension mm -hmm. forward, not so much into the elbow where a lot of people who use the shoulder incorrectly start to talk about that they feel discomfort, but actually um, in my hand. And to the point where I would lose um, feeling. Oh, uh. Okay. And so what I discovered through trying a bunch of different batons is that I need one where I could keep my fingers extended a little more than it's kind of customary. Um, so that the end of the baton needs to sit like in the back pocket of my palm. Okay. So my hand is a little, so the handle on the baton is probably about that long, even though I don't have very large hands, um, but it sits comfortably there and that it allows me to keep my hand a little more open instead of closed, which relaxes my forearm. And then it allows more movement in the wrist and flexibility now as much tension. And that, that translates back up in to the shoulder and it forces me to minimize the movement there and to stay more relaxed with it. Because otherwise, if I'm gripping back here, I feel like, like I'm punching almost down all the time. Yeah. And then I get really rigid here and I start generating all the movement from inside the shoulder. And then, you know, at the end of the concert, I'm over here like this. Like just I got to put an ice pack yeah. on it. Yeah, it's just done. Um, so to the, you know, a very long um, answer to your question, yeah, I, um, I do have the carved baton but for a very specific reason. Yeah, yeah. that's fair. It's interesting, uh, the, the, that whole uh, experience. It, it's, yeah, and you're right, we're both similarly built. Um, yep. My, um, this is part of, part of what has led my martial arts journey to some of the in Chinese internal arts, because they focus a lot on fluidity efficiency of motion um you know because you know I've, I've had my issues you know, like you said with kind of uh over overpowered gross movement yeah you know uh but studying those arts and starting to learn movement that's a, a you know a lot more relaxed and um you know focused as needed you know um and it's it's helped me help a lot of other people who you know, have similar issues with bunching up stress in different places and analyzing movement is like oh I have this recurring you know uh, some recurring pain in their body you know, like how how can we how can we renovate their movement so mm -hmm. that they work things out um, but yeah it's it's. It, it's really interesting to hear you, uh, you know, your it, like the internal martial arts journey of your conducting, as, as it were. Yeah, I, and I don't practice it as frequently as I should, or as regularly as you do. Um, but also because I'm, I'm not running a dojo. Um, but when I have had periods where I've put in dedicated time for let's say a two-month period to yoga mm -hmm. i've felt a lot of relief in some of the chronic aches and pains that tend to annoy me um, i don't have anything that is debilitating at this point um, I, I have thrown my back out a few times and last summer was exceptionally bad mm. um, you know, to the point where I was convinced that they needed to do an MRI and, you know, it, it was just so locked up. Like I just couldn't, I couldn't move. Um, and I did it twice last summer, which was fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, but what happened, uh, I was actually doing daily workouts with my students via Zoom because I was anticipating coming back because I was all like, oh yeah, everyone will stay home for four weeks and it'll be great. Right. 
Okay, yeah. Yeah, we're still going to go to Disney. Um, so we were, I was trying to keep everyone conditioned because I was anticipating, like, we're going to have, like, two weeks to get, get back and get ready and go perform at Disney. We got to be ready to go. We were doing a cycle through the week. Like, um, like Monday we would do a workout from this group called uh, Marching Health. Um, really great organization and a lot of good workouts that are all – centered around uh, body movement and muscle movement that you use in March. Um, but they're full body workouts and they're stretching and a lot of good stuff in there. And so we do that on Mondays, Wednesdays. Um, one of my former band students, her dad runs a boxing club in Chicago Heights and he would log on and he would coach us through like a 30 minute like boxing session. And Oh my God. You know, it'd just be a puddle on the floor. And then Fridays, like we do a HIIT workout with one of my PE teachers, but Tuesdays and Thursdays we did yoga. Hmm. And we were getting, some of us were getting pretty good at it. Well, the school year ended and we were, we moved last summer. And so then all the energy went to just packing everything and cleaning and painting and scraping. And I kind of neglected all the workouts we were doing. And I was painting um, baseboards and I was on my hands and knees and I was halfway up and I grabbed the bucket of paint and I lifted it and pop the back went. But it had been three weeks since I had done a workout, you know, and and I know in three weeks, you're not going to lose everything that you've accomplished. But as we get older, it disappears a lot quicker. But it's like my core was not what it was three weeks ago. You know, had I still been doing those workouts, had I still been doing yoga, I might not have thrown my back up last summer. Um, But what helped me, in addition to the physical therapy that I was getting, as I started to do core and flexibility oriented flows, and it and it helped so much. Mm. Um, You know, so whatever movement practices that you have been taking on for yourself, and then by extension, um, working with your students on, I'm sure having a similar effect to probably what I experienced. Yeah, no, I, the, uh, I, the larger issue is just that most people don't move enough period, you know, and then finding something you know, like for, for, for us, it's, it's the martial arts, you know, you guys have done your yoga and your, you know, various other workouts, but the average person just doesn't move, you know, I mean, think of, look at what we're doing right now. I mean, this is kind of the nature of the thing, but we're sitting here looking at a screen, talking to each other. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not like, it's not like we're both riding bicycles at the same time that we're talking or, or, or Or even walking. Yeah. Right. Um, Yeah. And I, I've pointed that out to a lot, especially students I get who are, um, you know, let's say 50 or older, I have to kind of remind them like, look, you, it may not feel that way to you, but you're, you're relatively sedentary mm-hmm. and you know, like some of these problems, like in your back, your shoulders, your knees, whatever, like, let's just start moving them again in, in just broad general ways and then see what happens. Like we'll, we'll get to the more complicated, like, you know, Kung Fu movement or whatever, you know, like yeah. leaping around, spinning, whatever you want you know, jump kick, jump kick people in the face. But how how about let's start by sitting down and standing up a couple times in a row and just, you know, um, but yeah, no, the, uh, also, uh, I I know I've talked with Ginsburg about this in the past. um, Just the importance of physical health for, for music specifically. You know, I, I've, I've, uh, I, I've, I've uh, harped on this with a lot of my students over the years. Like, you know, we, we were playing a wind instrument. You know, it's not, it's going to help you if you do something that helps build your wind. Yeah. Like, you know, I mean, Ginsburg, when I was there, I, I remember he talked about, you know, swimming, tennis, like, you know, going out, you know, hiking or whatever, like the kinds of things that, you, you you can enjoy and you know it's not like you're training for a prize fight but like just movement that's taxing your 
taxing your body enough to, to, to be healthy. Right. Um, but I, know. with that, Frank, I mean, and, and the lack of movement, of course, over the last year has been exponentially bad. So today, uh, and so this is my third week of getting up at like 4.30 and exercising before I leave for work, which is not easy for me. It, it's not. Um, but I need to be healthier for myself and for my family. And I just, you know, I want to feel better. Um, and so, you know, but I also know that it's easier for me to do it before I leave because when I come home for the day, and I hit that couch, it's game over. Yeah. You know, I don't want to move anymore. You know, I, I, and, I, and I'd like to sit down for dinner, not a hot, sweaty mess after having just worked out, you know. And so this morning, um, I got 2.6 miles in on the treadmill before I left for the day. So I had about 8,400 steps in already before I walked out of the house. But now today going to work on top of that and having students in the building and just moving around, right? Because today's was the first day with students. So I was actually physically interacting with space again and moving from the office to my classroom and setting things up and taking things down. Um, I've got almost 16,000 steps in for the day. If I didn't intentionally do the treadmill, I'd have about 8,000, okay, which is all right, but, you know, that's 10,000 threshold, right? Um, but if I did the, 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 the treadmill and then went into the office and just sat and did lessons on the computer all day, I'd be in the same situation. And then having done neither of those things, I'd probably be at like 1,500 or 2,000 steps for the whole day, yeah. you know, and that's nothing. And I think back on, the, on the, the whole year and how much we've just sat. And I'm grateful that my clothes st- still fit me as well as they do. Because <laughs> <Yes. laughs> you know, they shouldn't, you know, because I mean, none of us really reduced our caloric intake. Yeah, if anything, it's it's gone up because all these all these restaurants have gone to a delivery and carry out with great ease. Right, <laughs> right. You know, and, and, and then instead of going out and eating or, you know, you know, interacting with people while we're eating, we're just, you know, so many of us have, have found, you know, satisfaction in the, in, in the, in the gluttony of, you know, getting that carry out and just, oh, I'll just go home and eat it. Oh, this is delicious. Well, I'm not going anywhere tomorrow. Yeah, I can eat immediately more. fall asleep right after you eat. Right. Yeah. And, and I'm guilty of all of it. And it's, uh, when you look back on it, you kind of go this has been really bad. It really has. Um, but, uh, so yeah, yeah. Movement, just move. I mean, I remember that one, there was one afternoon out in front of Brown where we were, we were using the little, we were using the, the bags, the grip bags. With yeah. The, yeah. Were they filled with sand or, um, or pellets, or yeah, I had I, the, it's probably the same ones I'm still using. With uh, one, the little one had steel shot inside. Yeah, and you were like, "Oh, we're gonna do this thing." I thought it was really cool, but then before we did anything, you're like, "We're just gonna stand here and breathe." I'm like, what? And I, I and, and it's something that I remember though doing with you, and how impactful it was to just stand there and pay attention to how your feet are interacting with the ground and where your balance is and which muscles you're engaging to just try to stand in a certain way. And are you controlling your breathing or is it just doing what it wants to do? You know, and so many of those things and you talked me through all of it, that, 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 that is a memory that stands out. And I actually use that with my students. Um, we'll do our, our, like, especially in marching camp, um, we warm up with walking and moving and just doing some fundamental stuff. But 
we do a probably a 20 minute stretching yoga ish session. Um, and then we stand for about three minutes and just breathe and we get ourselves centered, you know, and especially out in the marching field, you need to understand how you're connected to that surface. Yeah. <laughs> you know? So I'm, I'm grateful for having that experience with you. Well, I'm, I'm glad it, I'm glad it was of value to you. I know that that's one of the things I, I still do that with um, everyone I teach. Um, but I found it's one of those things that just drives people. It, it, it like mentally it drives people, drives people nuts because people, uh, have an aversion to, to being alone with themselves, with themselves that long. And, and then um, I've had seasoned athletes. Like I, I started actually my old, uh, my old strength coach, he, he started coming into the, to the school to, to do some cross training with me. And I had him do standing postures the same way. And it, it like blasted him after a minute and a half, it just because there there's it, it's a way it, it's a way you engage it, it, like you said it's a way you engage your body that's very yeah if you haven't done it before it's very different and and it, it can be very taxing uh the, you know it, it, to to the you know if you're new to it um and it's he's told me since he started his standing practice he's noticed a lot of um like uh, avoiding uh, avoiding um, injury or exhaustion longer for for certain things. Um, he he feels better connected for because um, he's he's also training at a at a boxing gym. Uh, he's doing a lot of cross training, but like he feels he, he feels benefit in even in that setting from that practice. Yeah. Um, you know, he's <laughs> it's become something he's prescribed it to. Uh, people he works with like try 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 standing like you know try this um you know i mean it's nice it's nice to to get the novelty out of it but then to start people start really digging into the the benefits and in it and it's it's an endless endless source of benefit like um you know three minutes is actually a respectable amount of time like I, i've had people who don't who don't make it too uh, before they, before they just have to stop. Um, I, and I, I issue the challenge to people, you know, whoever's listening, uh, you can, you can try it too. you know, try one to five minutes standing like that standing posture and then see if you can hit an hour. <laughs> the, uh, I mean, if assuming you can find an hour to, to do one thing at one, you know, at that, for that long stretch, but you know, the, all, a lot of the old Kung Fu stories were like, you had to maintain, you know, it, 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 you know, some form of the standing posture for a minimum of an hour before a teacher would even look at you to to allow you into their school. Um, I mean, who knows? There's a whole mix of folklore and history, and who knows what really was. But you'll always, in in my in my experience, you'll always find something new uh, of benefit the longer the longer you try that standing practice. Yeah. Um, but yeah, uh, sorry. I'm glad, I'm glad you're, I'm, I'm glad you're getting something good out of it. Well, maybe for my students, it's easy because their brains just aren't filled with enough stuff yet. You know, <laughs> just, yeah. the, vo the, the void is still present and they can just eat. <laughs> you know? no, yeah. no, I'm, I'm sincerely joking. My students are wonderful for any of them who are listening. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, I remember that. I remember, um, Ah, uh, I remember doing circle drills with you, where we were just um, wrist on wrist and oh, rotating. yeah, uh, push push hands. That's, yes. Um. So yeah, the principle of take uh, like the the what started with the standing and the awareness of your body. And now the initial contact of being aware of somebody else and what they're doing. Um, so a lot of, um, a lot of sensitivity and, and awareness. Um, 
I, I have a hard time introducing my younger students to stuff like that. Cause they just want to kick and punch and do, you know, do the karate Kung Fu stuff. But um, it's, I don't know. There's a lot, there's a lot loaded in those practices. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. But it, and, it feels, it feels, and I, and I think maybe, when we met each other and when you were teaching me some of the things that you knew, my experience with martial arts up to that point was also very punchy, kicky and knifey, you know, and I was aware of the calmer practice and I had no aversion to it just had not been anything that was introduced to me. But I was also very much in, in, and we watched some of the UFC fights together and stuff. And, you know, it was like the hype culture at the moment. We're like, yeah. hey, you know, uh, and, and, and as someone who was never like really athletic, I think I was really excited to be tuned into it because I kind of felt like a part of it. I was like, oh yeah, I'm a part of that. You know? Never been in a cage fight, you know, like, <laughs> um, and that's okay. Um, but when when you showed me this stuff, and here's I'm getting to my point with it, um, I think I was as welcoming to it as I am for the same reasons that you and I are both very comfortable and gravitate towards resetting fundamentals with our students, right? I think my music practice informed my openness and my willingness to take on, albeit challenging, but that simplistic approach where it's this baseline function and that's all it needs to be. And so, you know, there was so much related in that moment that I'm unpacking it right now as we're talking here. I, I, I had never thought of it that way before, but as this conversation is unfolding, these things are sort of devel- um, just developing. Um, I really think that's what it was. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, <laughs> well, that's, uh, those are good moments then when, uh, they're, they're so, uh, they're so condensed, we can still go back and, uh, find the value. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's, that's good. I mean, uh, and I, I see things the same way, you know, uh, that's, probably a lot of how uh, I've related to my music students is through that martial context as well. Um, actually, I have one student who, that that connection is very direct because um, the same the same day he'll have his clarinet lesson with me, he'll also go to the mat. And like, oh, okay. So he, he's doubling up. Um, I think mom likes the value of being able to do both <laughs> at one with one person sure um i uh, i'm i'm gonna hope that because uh, you know that's the thing with with f- fundamentals practice is you know the those are those are dense practices that if if you have the mentality to reach to them later like you know you're you're you know, you're always digging in i I don't know. I don't know if uh, how deep. Uh, I don't know how deep that student uh, understands things quite yet. I think it's it, we we have we have a little humor about you know. I'm yelling at you behind the stand, and now I'm going to yell at you on the mat. <laughs> but um, I try to, I, w- especially with him, I've tried to actively point out the connections between the two practices because mm-hmm. um, he's doing both. Um, I don't know. We'll see. Uh, maybe he'll take the reins from me one day, if uh, he doesn't end up being an accountant or something. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you know. that's. I mean, I that's another earmark of my studio. I found over the years, like I have, I don't think I've had anyone graduate from my studio and go on to study music, but it seems like they all go on to some satisfying professional career with, you know, um, enough ability to to play music in their community groups when they want, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And I, I don't think I ever had the goal of like producing more professional musicians. 
I, you know, I just want for, for me, I wanted to produce people who really understood the clarinet and were free, free to express themselves with, you know, wh- whatever music was put in front of them. Yeah. You know, um, the, you know, I, I don't, I don't see you as the kind of person who is like, you know, shuttling your students specifically to a career in music. You know, I feel like, I feel like I've seen some people like get railroaded in because they don't know any, any different or any better, but that, I've, that's ri- a- I, I've written, I started that wrong. I've helped maybe half as many students apply for trade school as I have for college. But with equal excitement. Uh, I have a student right now who still sends me messages all the time. Hey, Mr. B, how's the band going and everything? And, and he's a He's a diesel mechanic. Nice. That's great. You know, I mean, uh, I wish I was making $35 an hour two years out of high school, you know? Um, And I think this, this ties into part of the conversation we were having earlier about building that consumer audience, right? If we're, if we're, graduating literate musicians who appreciate music from a wide variety of genres um, and who are capable of lucrative careers, whatever path they choose, we're developing consumers. They're not practicing musicians. They're, They're on the consuming end. And if they have that career or they have disposable income, at a certain point, they're going to spend that on something that they know and that they're comfortable with. Mm. And that's what we've done with them. You know? So I, I think it's more important that we are producing students who love and appreciate what we teach and will continue to consume it down the road. And if we have one or, you know, I've been averaging like, two every year who are going to music school Mm. and i'm good with that um i have i have one this year who is going into music ed i have one who's going into sound engineering and i have one who's going into music theater uh, and i have one who's going into film study Mm. i think those are all the humanities that we've got covered right now um you know, I have one from two years ago who is a flute performance major at Eastern. Um, and I have one from last year who is, go. Oh, she's a, a um, music therapist uh, yeah. student, you know, but everyone else is doing their own thing, but they're excited about what the band is still doing. And I hope that by extension, that means that they will continue to be excited about the type of music that they played. And we'll consume it in some capacity in the future. Yeah. So, yeah, even even if it's coming and buying a, a ticket for our concert. There you go. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. then I can buy another tuba. <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> yeah. Oh man, um, what's uh, do you have any uh, artistic or professional goals specifically that you're you're shooting for in the sometime in the future and it seems like you're, you're in a pretty good spot now and it's kind of evolved organically to what it is now uh with your you know with your work but yeah um the first goals were definitely the numbers game just get more kids in the program and then you know feel it out from there um i wanted to open the option for a core style competitive band early and get the buy-in because I knew that as a result of that, I'd get that like next level of discipline. Mm. And that's exactly what happened. Um, 
set commitment and just, you know, work ethic as a result of those things. Um, ideally, what I would like my program to look like is uh, I, I, I want another director in the program with me. Um, are you, are you, you're just totally solo right now? Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. Wow. Yeah, like the, the only the only extracurricular coach that I have is for color guard, and it's not a position that had been filled in a very long time, and so it was a challenge to fill it. You know, and I I, I get it. You know, with educational bureaucracy, when things don't happen for a long time, and there's all of a sudden this guy with all this excitement and all these changes and these numbers. And they're all like, Whoa. Yeah. What? It was like, <laughs> I told you in the interview <laughs> and I did, I said, the numbers are going to grow up. I need you to be prepared. Um, but yeah, I would like, I would like a, a, a partner. Um, we've got the three levels of band right now. I want to consistently offer AP theory. Um, I'm working on a proposal right now with one of my visual art colleagues on we're, we're going to end up branding it as an art appreciation course, but we're not focusing on dates and periods so much as, as we are focusing on aesthetic movements. All right. So we're, we're, we're going to work with the kids to give them the vocabulary of different aesthetic movements so that they can appreciate things from a variety of perspectives. But our main goal, is, second to that, is um, destabilizing the Eurocentric viewpoint on artistic work. Hmm. You know, as so many of us have grown up with it, is that's how we learn about art, right? Um, and, you know, and when when we, you know, and I don't know if you took the the class or not. But, you know, like I took a non-West music class, and you know, it, that language doesn't work so well anymore, and it shouldn't, um, because if we are studying and appreciating aesthetic concepts and artistic movements from everywhere in the world from any time period, we need to take them on their own terms, hmm. right? And not through the lens of Western art music or, you know, Eurocentric sculpting and, and, and paintings. And so that's our other goal is, is to take, take those things from all over the world and you know, study them and analyze them as we would, the, you know, the Sistine Chapel, you know, or, 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 or um, you know, Tristano de Solda. Um, they all have the same value. Um, and our goal with that is to empower our students um, so that they feel more reflected in what we study. We have a wide variety of students, um, from a wide variety of demographics. And so many of them don't know about the art of their ancestors or even their contemporaries, but it's out there and it's so accessible now. Man. So, you know, the three ensembles, um, AP theory and aesthetics appreciation. Um, and ideally I would like, like a, 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 a keyboarding and sound production course kind of tied into one. Um, and I think that would give us a really well-rounded program. Um, as a bonus, I like a separate percussion class. Mm. Um, you know, it's, you know, as far as the program structure, that's what I would love to see. Um, I'm not looking to take the competitive marching band to like BOA, um, you know, with, we don't have those resources and, and I don't plan on working that hard to get those resources. Yeah. Um, the local regional competitions that a lot of the high schools in the area run are fantastic. 
you know, and that's what the kids need. You know, they, they want that competitive experience. They want to share in the community with the other schools who are doing it, see what they're doing, appreciate what they're doing, have them appreciate us, maybe meet some friends along the way, you know, and, and it's, it's a Saturday and then we come back, you know, and, and that's, that's what we're looking for with that. Um, I want my HBCU style show band to be anywhere from 80 to a hundred members. And I want it to be fun and clean and engage the audience. Um, fun and clean as far as the technique. Um, you know, <laughs> I've had, I've had colleagues and students ask if they're going to have, um, uh, uh, you know, majorettes in front of the band, um, you know, like, uh, like Southern jukebox, uh, like the human jukebox from Southern uh, University. And I'm like, no, no, because they're, they're, they're young and I'm not going to know. So, and, and they understand that, <laughs> you know, but those are tough conversations to have because for a lot of, a lot of our students who, you know, look up to Southern and, you know, Florida A&M and, and Jackson, mm. that's what they see. And that's what they understand as part of, the band culture and at the college level it is you know and and there are reasons why all of those parts fit together at the college level um there's a challenging conversation to have with students so it's like we, we're not going to do that here right and and it's okay that we're not going to do that here um you know i enjoy the parades that we're in uh the south side irish parade the chicago thanksgiving day parade um you know, I'd be interested in traveling somewhere, maybe for like a New Year's or a holiday parade at some point. Mm -hmm. um, and then with festivals, um, it's really tricky with scheduling because I teach at two different buildings and um, like the musical schedules interfere a lot of times with like IHSA organizational. Um, but I'd, I'd like to, you know, I want to get my groups consistent, consistently at division ones, you know, and organizational. We're getting there, um, but we haven't been to an organizational festival in three years because scheduling hasn't allowed us to do so. Mm. Yeah. So those are um, program and our and artistic goals. There's some pieces that I want to conduct with my bands, but as part of our discussion earlier, it's it's the timing. You got to wait for the right group and make sure you're not going to push them too too hard, yeah. you know, dissuade them from wanting to be a part of it. Um, but I'm I'm. I'm really happy with, with where I am. The, the school has allowed me to really take the program, the direction that I see fits. Um, and this is with anything, you know, there's been some hurdles along the way. You just have to explain things to people. You know, it's going this way for these reasons. Trust me, I got this. You know? And you now then there's the moments for them where, you know, they see us on TV on Thanksgiving morning, they go, Okay, Balecki was right. Yeah, we got this. Okay. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, you know, it's sort of a pipe dream, but I, I'd, I'd love to be able to, to bring in professionals like yourself for, you know, lessons um, during the school day. But, you know, honestly, on that list of things that I just rattled off, that's probably the one with the lowest probability. Mm. You know, just because of the logistics of our day and the, you know, the demographics, uh, the income, the socioeconomic you know, limitations of a lot of our students to be able to you know, pay for that. And so, but um, but it's it's my kids are fantastic, and I think the best thing about where I work is they appreciate with so much depth everything that we accomplish they don't take anything for granted you know even as success has become more of a part of our story mm -hmm. every little thing they're like hey we did that yeah yeah we did and they just they just latch on to it and they love it and it's so cool because when it's rewarding for them it's rewarding for us and you know it's uh yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, then, nothing yeah. nothing's expected that gratitude is a big deal. That's because um, I, I've also seen the opposite, like uh, what I consider well-run programs, and the students don't always see it as uh, the blessing that it is. Right. Um, but that's that's uh, 
that's very fortunate um, that your your students have that that outlook. Um, it's it's probably better for your for your peace of mind too. Because oh, yeah. I don't think I could stand to work somewhere where people people thought my program was um, you know so just like a hurdle so they could get extra credits to to uh, you know for for some college deal or whatever. I don't know what whatever all the other uh, um, you know games are that are out there for for people's program. Mm-hmm. Um, anyways, I, I'm I'm it's good. I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. Um, let's see. There's uh, we're we're getting we're getting into the double digit hours uh, here. We are. Yeah. Um, let me uh, let me see here. Um, I'll lay another <laughs> lay another girthy one on you. All right. What's what do you think is the hardest lesson you've learned through all of this? I have had to learn to listen to adults in ways that I never have before. Hmm. I've always been good at listening to my students, but especially with people who are not of my discipline when they doubt what I'm trying to do. It doesn't go over well for me mentally. (laughs) And I tend to retaliate with a, a, a unbridled energy professional but really push back hard in ways that I I, I don't necessarily need to when the conversation can be had in in a different way and so you know I I think uh, I guess to put it more concisely just to you know negotiating with other people's opinions and perspectives who don't necessarily understand what it is that we do in the classroom. That's been one of the hardest things, you know, because especially where, where I'm at, you know, I'm the only instrumental music teacher in the district. I am the only one with this degree. You know, I am the only one with this amount of experience. So when it comes to anything with this program, well, just listen to me and that's it. But as with anything with people in general, that's not always how it works Yeah. You know, unless you own the company, you know, um, but even then you're going to get pushed back from some employees, right? Because negotiating, uh, di- you know, interpersonal dynamics, um, you know, so I think that that's, that's been the, the most challenging thing is, is, negotiating those interpersonal dynamics because (laughs) even though logically I know that I can't expect it emotionally I want to see the passion for my subject reflected back to me and everybody else who has a vested interest you know I I want to see my, my administrators and my colleagues with the same excitement that like you and I would have for our students. And, you know, again, logically, I know it's, it's not ever going to be there, you know, with a few exceptions, but if we get it a little bit there, you know, so yeah, I, I, that's, yeah, that, and then um, putting boundaries on when I'm accessible to my students, Mm. you know, part of the reason that, that this took off is because I, I would engage, it would be available to them 
almost 24 seven. Oh, um, you know, I mean, I, I, I've had students reach out to me in the middle of the night because they've just been kicked out of their house mm. and they don't know what to do. And okay, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to take that, you know, but like the other night I, I had a student blowing me up on remind like, Hey, I don't really feel well today. I can't get all these, all these um, practice or playing assessments done. Um, you know, can, can I get an extension? Blah, 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 you know, like seven messages in a row. It gets 8.30 on a Saturday night. And I've already given everyone 48 hours in an extension for late work, right? I didn't respond to that. Because, no, two years ago, I probably would have, mm. you know. And when you, when, you, when you start to establish boundaries like that, you worry, you know, is it going to alienate certain students? Is it going to turn students away from the program? But what you have to do is just, um, you know, trust that, you know, at the end of the day, they know that they're kids too. Um, and that you do have a personal life. And that they're not a part of it, you know, and the boundaries are healthy for everyone Yeah. because in class today, that student, did she act any differently? Was she mad? No, she understood. And it went on. And, and that was the, that was the thing. And it was, it was a hard lesson for some students um, throughout the last two years, but it's been a lot healthier for me and I've been a better teacher because of it. Yeah. Just, you know, our time needs to be our time because that's who we are. So, yeah. Nice. Uh, what else do you do? We've, we've talked so much about your uh, music and uh, your, your program. And, you yeah. know, speak, speaking of your boundaries outside, yeah. what, what, what is it you do out there? Um. And I have your offspring. That's that's one. Yeah, I mean, you know, being being a dad is is, is a lot of times. Dad. Yes. Um, what? Uh, it's been incredible with my my two kids. They're they're absolutely wonderful. Um, they're just they're good little people. Um, yeah, I mean they're they're jerks to each other a lot of times. Um, you know, but but they're they're good humans. And, and that's, it's an awesome thing, but, um, you know, my son, Liam, who's nine is super into Legos, which is awesome for me because, you know, I can buy Legos a lot and, you know, <laughs> well, it's like, extension of your childhood. Yes. Yes. Um, you know, and we build stuff together and, you know, but he's at the point now where, so like uh, for Christmas, um, you know, he, he got the, the Millennium Falcon. Ooh. Uh, I mean, the, the moderate sized one, not like the $900 one. And, and um, by he, you mean we, right? He, <laughs> both so, of, the both of you got the Millennium Falcon. Yeah, that was the thought. Um, and then when I asked him, you know, 25 minutes into his build, I'm like, hey, buddy, you need any help with this? No, I got it. Damn it! <laughs> you get your secret second one for you uh, to build in your basement away from over here. <laughs> yeah, um, you know, and uh, and he's he's really into Star Wars, which is awesome. And um, you know, he's getting into video games. Like we're we're doing, uh, we finished um, uh, the Lego Marvel on oh, the okay. Wii, which is fun and. We're doing this uh, this Lego uh, Star Wars one now, which is cool. Um, and then Ella, she's man, she's 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 a firecracker. Um, she's like kind of wicked smart, mm. and she's got a really quick witticism about her too. That's like six years beyond her age. Oh wow. Oh man, she'll snap back with some stuff because she like she sees the sarcasm between my wife and I, mm -hmm. 
She picks up on it really, really well. And she'll say some things back to us, like original thoughts, not just copying them. And while we're supposed to be mad at her for it, the both of us have to just stop and kind of like, because <laughs> it's just so on point. Um, you know, but like, I'll sit and play, you know, Princess Games with her on the Wii. Um, you know, where, where we live now, um, we've got access to um, uh, Forest Preserve Trails, and it's a really nice neighborhood. You know, um, bike riding and outdoor stuff. And um, I've gotten, you know, and so that's with, with, my, with, with my kids. And um, I've gotten really into um, barbecuing lately. But like, uh. well, like, well, but like, actually like smoking meat, not just, oh, we're going to grill stuff. And that's come a long way in the last year, which has been really exciting. Um, I actually remember uh, one of the one of the last times we saw each other in person. I think there was uh, you were starting to experiment with with uh, smoking and and uh, barbecue stuff. Yeah, I, when yeah, was that? Too too long ago. Yeah, that's <laughs> so. At some point when uh, yeah, when when everyone feels safe enough uh, we'll need to reunite and uh you know some some amount of of uh, smoky meats must be involved mm-hmm. yeah um, um but it's but it's but it's been fun because it's um like my family enjoys it too which is cool because if i was just smoking meat for myself it would you know talk about having to get on the treadmill um <laughs> you know but a lot of pork shoulders and i've got that dialed in really nicely um you know, the house that we used to live in was built in 1928. And so it demanded a lot of work. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and as a result, I've gotten pretty good at doing home repairs and building things. Um, but outside of the necessity of it, I, I enjoy it. Um, and so I've started, started getting into some wood stuff. Um, but I enjoy working on the house. Um, I remodeled our laundry room in the fall, which you know, new, uh, like laminate flooring and I put in all new trim and everything and mm. some of it that I cut myself. And you know, so that, that was cool. Um, we watch a lot of Cubs baseball in our house. Um, my, my wife and I both, and that's one of the things that like we, we kind of bonded on. Um, you know, which is really fun. Um, yeah, um, we binge watch some series. She likes murder shows. And so by extension, I like murder shows. Yeah. You know, <laughs> um, you know uh, we just finished WandaVision. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. I saw, n- not even on purpose, but I saw, I think, episode eight. I just happened to be at a friend's house and he put it on like, okay. So that's, I guess like every, this is the one key episode that tells you exactly everything that's happened in the previous episodes. Um, yeah. Yeah. And you should watch it from the beginning though. Yeah. It seems interesting. I, mean, I I'm super behind on the, the Marvel universe. Um, I got, I, I got to get through, uh oh man i don't even remember where i stopped but you know it's like uh, more than two-thirds of that whole uh you know that whole universe i just didn't watch yet um but yeah and suddenly wandavision for one episode and and now and now uh creepy youtube has been trying to show me like little clips of it uh, like it knows that I watched it from from uh, my buddy's house. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. Yeah. Um, I wish I knew more about that character in general because it's you know everyone. I think everyone had some general idea of like Iron Man and Captain America and all like the major players, mm-hmm. but like I would I never remember being curious about you know Scarlet Witch or or Vision except now that I think about it, Vision was one of like. 
I think he was one of those special characters in one of the like maybe an X Man video game or something. You just like you hit the special button and then some random cape guy just shoots a beam across the. Yeah. Well, and I, I, I think can't, I, I can't quite remember. I think uh, you know when we grew up, you know the Marvel world at that point was it was all X Men. You know that was the thing, and you know when these Avenger movies started to come out, I remember kind of going, "Why? <laughs> like X Men is where it's at. Like make more of those." You know, not realizing what this was going to develop into, and they did an right. incredibly good job with it. Um, but I mean, Vision goes back to like the the golden era of the comics, you know. Um, and it was really interesting too, digging into the, the history on uh, Captain Marvel, who was not originally a woman, mm. you know, in the original comics. Um, you know, there's a lot of criticism that Marvel just sort of capitalized on the you know, feminism of, of the moment. Um, and maybe they did, but you know what? They, 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 they drew a really great character out of it. Um, and just, yeah, I, I think with, with, with a solid story. Um, but, you know, but I think, like at least with Scarlet Witch for me, and I agree with you, I didn't know a whole lot about Scarlet Witch getting into it, but it almost immediately, for me, I was drawing connections to uh, Psylocke. Mm -hmm. from the X-Men world, right? And so it made sense with, like, how powerful she was. Um, so, yeah, but it, but it, was, it was good to see some more character depth get fleshed out in, throughout the series. Um, but it, it's definitely weird, and there was a lot of things that, you know, people criticized about. Oh, it's so weird. I'm like, yeah, it is. Mm -hmm. Just commit to the weird. Roll with it. It's great. Right, right. Yeah. If it's if it's too easily understandable, what's the, what's the point? Like right. let's, let's it's like it's like exercise. If if it's easy, what what good is it doing you? Like, you know, um, and then yeah, the payoff at the end if once you've worked through the difficult bits, right? Uh, but yeah. have I, you uh, um? Have you, have, are you watching Cobra Kai? You know, I I haven't yet. Uh, that's something that it, it's like all everyone everyone's re recommended that I watch it and it's I, I think what what kept me from watching it in the first place was it, it was starting to hit a little close to home the concept of uh, you know some hometown guy trying to start up a, a small dojo and then they, like all the issues and and the hassles of of you know, basically, like, I, did, I just didn't feel like watching my, you know, like, reliving my small business experience. <laughs> but, you know, it's, I've also heard great things uh, about the show and the characters and all that, like, so at some point I will just, I have to get over myself and my, uh, um, <laughs> the, uh, the irritation of seeing, uh, you know, all the same stories play out for in, in, in initially of, of renting space and getting your initial customers. It's all, it's all yeah. very uh, irritating, but I will at, <laughs> at some point I will. If you don't, I won't think anything less of you. It's fine. Yeah. <laughs> um, I've, I've had a lot of people calling us Cobra Kai too. Just, I don't know why, because uh, we actually hit stuff in our school or I, I don't know. <laughs> um, but uh, all right, I'll, I'll I'll cut you loose pretty soon here. Let me let me ask you one uh, one more one more uh, wide girthy one here. All right, uh, is there what's something that you that you used to believe that you don't believe anymore? Oh man, and. I give everyone the same the same caveat. Like it doesn't have to be like some, you know, uh, profound soul wrenching thing. You know, it could just be like 
I happen to prefer, you know, Five Guys over Burger King. Oh. <laughs> you know, it, it can be trite if you want, but I'm leaving it, I'm leaving it open to you. Um, and we have talked a lot about your the program you've built, uh, so yeah. maybe maybe something to that uh, to that end if if you have it. Or I don't know, burgers are burgers are pretty tasty too. Yeah. Um, squares versus uh, pie slices. <laughs> Depends on how thick the piece is. Uh, yeah. Um. I used, and this is actually a really recent development. So it's a it's a cool question. I used to believe in a lot of a lot of assessment with my students, which looks and feels different in an ensemble classroom, of course, than it does in a private studio. Um, but throughout the course of the pandemic, it's caused me to reevaluate what my classroom should look and feel like from bell to bell. And so going forward, even when we're back in person, and I don't have all the logistics worked out for it yet, but I know conceptually where I'm going with it. I am no longer going to assess in the classroom as far as technique development and playing assessments like that. They're all going to be done digitally. Um, now I may provide time every day, like, okay, you want to go do your video, you could step out for five minutes and go do the thing and then come back in. Mm -hmm. But I've thought back to my experiences playing in ensembles when I was the happiest. And those rehearsals were just about rehearsing the music. There was no assessment built into those moments. And so I've reevaluated what my students' experience should be like during an ensemble rehearsal, and it should look more like what we experience at the college level. We come in, we warm up, to the rep for the day, and let's just work. And for those 40 minutes, none of my students are worried about the playing test that we're gonna do during this class or the written assignment that's due at the end. We're just going to play mm. and allow it to be that experience that it's supposed to so that they develop that connection to the music that we're trying to get where it's not my connection to the music because it's my grade. It's my connection to the music because we're, we're, we're creating this together, you know, I, I, I try to reinforce with my students as much as I can. Like, think about what we're doing here. We're manipulating sound. Like when you say it that way, like that sounds like some Doctor Strange stuff. Right. right? And we're shaping sound. And how cool is that? But if that experience is constantly tied to what score am I going to get? You know, Am I giving them the best value of their experience that I can? And I don't, th and I don't think that I am. No, that doesn't mean that Monday through Friday, our class is only going to be the rehearsal. You know, maybe Thursdays need to be, you know, sectionals and playing tests. Maybe. But an ensemble rehearsal days, that's it. And so... That, that's a change in belief. 
I also used to believe that the best steaks were cooked on the grill until a couple of weeks before Christmas last year. I did some ribeyes in a cast iron pan. Mm, that's a different ball game. Let me tell you. I'm, I haven't cooked steaks on the grill since. I mean, you know, that was uh, uh, my wife, Cynthia, found it was like Marshall or something. A really nice lodge pan for a really great price. Because I'd always see them. Like, I don't want to spend $60 on this. Yeah, yeah. You know? The barrier uh, to entry. Yeah. Um, but she, she grabbed it. And um, all right. And I got some decent steaks. And the butter and the herbs in there and the basting and just, you know, we sat down and we both cut into it and we're like, are we going to go to a steakhouse ever again? Because I don't know, <laughs> right. it, you know, and I'm not saying that to like, you know, hey, you know, good job on me. But like, there's a reason that there's been so much viral activity about cooking steaks in a cast iron pan over the last two years. Right. And it's not a new concept, but you know, like whatever it's yes. Cook your steaks in a cast iron pan, get it screeching hot, salt and pepper on them, put them in there, have the butter ready to go with some rosemary and thyme, baste it four minutes or so on each side, take it out, let it rest. Done. And making me, well, I know I'll admit I'm, I'm usually just hungry, but that, that <laughs> adds, that adds some more hunger to my baseline hunger. Yeah. <laughs> there, oh. Awesome. We got, we got a, we got a, a double answer for that. And uh, hey. one, one that I'm definitely going to be thinking about, uh, um, you know, through the rest of the week when, when I'm grocery shopping, um, is there anything I didn't ask you that I should have? Man, you know, you got, we've got quite a bit of catching up to do yet, you know, but yeah, for today, is there uh, anything, anything uh, that I've left on the table that you care to dip into? No, I, I found it really re rewarding how the questions you asked were very specific things, but allowed for the response to go in a variety of directions. And it ended up capturing so much with those one, you know, it's, uh, yeah. Well, I'm glad Almost you feel that way. Uh, I'm, I'm hoping, uh, I'm hoping the audience uh, sees it that way and gets their value out of it too. I mean, like I said, the, uh, a big part of why I'm doing this show at all is to, cause I, you know, um, everyone in my circle, I see you all with a particular value and I feel like, that value bears uh, some sharing with with a broader audience. So well, thank you. Yeah, I, I'm glad I'm glad you made the time, uh, and I'm glad you feel positive about the experience. Uh, I I presume this won't be the last time because <laughs> there's plenty there's plenty more to talk about. I'll probably I'll probably be uh, chasing people down for more more future content. But uh, I'm also looking forward to how your uh, how your program is going to play out and what you and your kids are going to accomplish. Um, Me too. Yeah. And I'm, I'm looking forward to when, uh, and this is, you know, this is becoming the phrase now, right? We, we've, the, the phrase that became annoying was, you know, these are unprecedented times or, yeah. you know, and then it was this year has been so weird. And now it's, you know, as things get back to normal, um, <laughs> know but as things do um you know i'd like to i'd like to come by your 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 your, your studio yeah um doors and, doors are open just let, let me know let me know ahead um but yeah um so any if there's any um links resources uh some of the artists or recordings we mentioned tonight uh feel free to send me all of that. I'll put it in the show notes, whatever you want me to share. Okay. Um, and if you wake up in the morning and realize like, like, Oh man, I really, I really didn't want to talk about 
you know, this thing that we talked about for 45 minutes. I'm happy to edit out anything, uh, anything you want to, you want to retract, but no, I, I, I don't think we talked about anything too, uh, uh, you know, too, too juicy. <laughs> no, not at all. I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I had some, you know, other than those steaks, it sounds pretty juicy. <laughs> they, they are. <laughs> um, no, it, it didn't, it didn't get anywhere. Nothing contentious. Um, you know, I, and I think it's the, you know, the, the only thing that could have possibly gone there just by, uh, you know, my opinions about certain administrators in my district, but I'm not, you know, but yeah. we're, we're not going to, we're not going to go. That's not what this is for. You know, the one thing, um, I guess, and I don't know how you would sneak this in there. Um, I, I would, I would suggest this for, for woodwind coaches of all disciplines. Um, I don't know how it translates uh, long term for every woodwind instrument, but the um, there's a variety of, of books by uh, Closé. Mm -hmm. um, but the one that I have actually started that I've used with my uh, with my woodwind students in my ensemble is the one the 25 daily exercises um, for saxophone. Um, it's the one that I know the best because of my study. But what that book did for me was it helped to balance my finger action because of how the lines are structured. Hmm. And it also improved my articulation because unlike, you know, the Fairling books or, uh, or the Rose books, right. In each study, there isn't really a variety of rhythm. You know, the lines are very technical, but they're fluid. Um, and even though they're technical, there's still melodic quality to them. But, you know, it, it's definitely more technical study than expressive as you would get from the Rose or the Fairling Institute. Um, but because, again, kind of coming back to this fundamentals, right? Because each one of those tackles very specific concepts with the technique, I remember as a student of those books feeling like my finger work got cleaner and my articulations got more precise and I was able to execute them with a greater variety um, and clarity at the same time. And so I've used, I've started to use that with my woodwinds and I've actually taken um, the first study and what we, what we did when we came back from winter break is I gave it to all my woodwinds as it's written um, And then we worked on that for two weeks, but I only did the first half of it. Um, it gets to the, like the second, the, um, the second variation of it. And then for the next two weeks, I just moved it up a half step. Like now have fun with that key signature, right? Um, but, and so I guess it's, you know, a specific pedagogical thing. I think this is the thing that works really well. Um, and even if you don't use all of the exercises in their entirety, there's definitely some material, material in there where you could take little snippets of it and it would translate fairly well uh, for trumpet um, and, and probably euphonium as well. Yeah, no, across uh, instruments. Yeah, uh, not necessarily for trombone. And I think some of the demands get a little pushy for bassoon. Um, probably for tuba. Well, no, because of the valves. No, it would work for tuba as well. Um, but I would say for any ensemble director or even any studio teacher looking for something. I mean, obviously, if you're, if you're a, a saxophone teacher, you're going to be using this book because it's written for you. But if you're not a saxophone teacher, I would suggest exploring it. Um, I know if you're a clarinet teacher, you, you know Close A, 
um, but maybe you don't know this particular one yeah, because it's right. a saxophone. Um, but I think there's a lot of stuff that translates really well. Um, and anything, you know, it attacks those, those technical demands very simplistically and gives the students the space that they need to grow. Nice. I'm sure uh, the, uh, the teachers out there listening are, are, uh, are, are open to uh, new resources or, or uh, cross cross referencing. Yeah. But yeah. um so also uh, it's it's good to see you again you know, albeit on a tiny screen. Yeah. Um you know looking forward to the the in person uh hopefully soon. Hopefully uh, soon. Yeah. yeah. As, as soon as is reasonable. Um uh your shoot me everything you want to share I'll put it in the show notes. Okay. But Mike, thanks again for making the time. It's been a uh, a, a rich and and meaty and and uh, wide and and firm uh, interview. Uh, <laughs> I, yes, uh, I, I, yeah. <laughs> a ste- a steam bath of thoughts. Yes, um, but it's good. I. I um, it's it's what it's how I like to talk, and I you know, if people don't like it, they don't have to listen to it. <laughs> so, but uh, you know, again, great great value, and I'm I'm glad you made the time to to uh, spend with me. So no, I I was glad to do it, and I I appreciate you asking me. I mean the 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 people who we've had on on the channel so far, I was like, you want to talk to me? I will. Okay, I mean, you know, uh, to to be you know. Uh, on your list with them, um, it, it, it's humbling, and, and I, I appreciate you recognizing, um, you know, the work that my students are doing, um, you know, and, and 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 honoring that by, you know, talking to me about it. Um, it it's thank you. Thank yeah, you. Thank, no, thank you. Um, all right. Well, I'll um, I'll harass you offline at some point soon. But uh, thanks again, and. Uh, I'll, I'll see you. Looking forward to it. Have a good evening, Frank. This is one of those moments that I'm going to creatively edit out my, my verbal pauses. Yeah. I'll have, I'll have a little, uh, you know, poof of smoke or something. And, <laughs>